Hi, my name is Bob Tabor, and in this course, you'll learn about JavaScript, the language. This course is aimed at those who are absolute beginners, so beginners to JavaScript, and frankly, given that we're going to discuss some very basic things like if statements and for loops, it's really designed for those who are beginners to programming in general. So if you know some HTML and some CSS and you want to learn JavaScript, awesome, you're in the right place. Also, there's nothing specific to Windows in this course. The tools that I use will be free and available in Mac and Linux as well. So you should be able to follow along no matter which operating system you're comfortable with using. Now, my background is really not all that important, but in case you're curious, I am a software developer by day and by night I run a website called Developer University or DevU. You can visit me at www.devu.com. Occasionally Microsoft invites me to create courses and what you see here is a collaboration between myself and the good folks at Microsoft Virtual Academy. I've been creating courses like this since 2004 and I created a very successful version of, jo of a JavaScript course way back in 2011. It's been viewed millions of times and I've gotten a lot of very positive feedback about it. This is a rewrite, a complete rewrite of that course uh, because uh, frankly JavaScript has changed dramatically in the what six or seven years since I originally recorded that course. Uh, and so if you're already a software developer coming from a different programming language, just kind of to pick back up what I said earlier, this might move a little bit slow for you. It just wasn't designed with you in mind. There might be some other courses that uh, can move you through the, the introductory material a little bit more quickly than what I plan on, uh, than, than the pace that I plan to take with this course. And my focus is the JavaScript language, the pure language, not web development necessarily, although we will discuss JavaScript in the context of the web browser at the very end of this course, but I felt like teaching JavaScript and how it's implemented in the web browser clouded the discussion of JavaScript, the language itself. So we're gonna be writing what amounts to console or rather command line style applications to isolate JavaScript, the language, uh, as purely and simply as possible without clouding it with a bunch of HTML and CSS and things like that. We're gonna discuss the language, we'll discuss popular patterns that have emerged from the JavaScript development community to help overcome some of the challenges associated with working with such a highly dynamic language. Uh, such a unique language and sometimes kind of a quirky language. Uh, the last time that I recorded the course uh, about JavaScript, way back in 2011, uh, the, uh, the course actually had a fairly long shelf life. And so much has changed with JavaScript since then that uh, I, it necessitated that I actually play catch up and kind of learn some of the new features that were added because I wasn't keeping my skill set uh, up. That's how quickly things change out from under you if you're not careful. If you know anything about JavaScript, you know that the community around JavaScript is moving extremely quickly. It's the most popular programming language, not just in the web browser, uh, where there are hundreds of JavaScript frameworks and libraries that you can leverage in your own applications. Uh, but it's also becoming one of the most popular languages for server-side web development, meaning uh, the code that actually runs on a web server that can perform business logic, that can interact with data storage, uh, databases and, and other uh, styles of, of data storage. And we're not going to talk about any of those topics in depth per se, uh, but it is important to know that it all starts with a basic understanding of the things that we will discuss in this course, the absolute basics of JavaScript. So since this course may have a long shelf life, it's important to know that some of the features of the latest version of JavaScript, which I will be covering in this course, may not yet be implemented in all web browsers, depending on when you view this course. And then uh, you have to take into account that some of the people viewing your website, for example, might be using very old 
uh, web browsers. And so you have to keep that in account as well. So I'm gonna make two general suggestions and I'm gonna try to remind you about these at the very end. Uh, there are still people on the internet that are viewing web pages with browsers that were created 10 years ago. So clearly in these cases, the newer features of JavaScript, many of which we'll discuss in this course, will not be available in those browsers and your JavaScript won't even work in those web browsers. So you have a choice at that point. You can, you can go one of two routes. You can either attempt to write your code in such a way that it is, is as friendly as possible to those older web browsers. Or you can use a tool which will transpile your JavaScript code that you write using the latest features of JavaScript. It'll transpile it back into a version of JavaScript that is compatible with all web browsers, even those that were built 10 years ago. And it uses a combination of techniques to accomplish this. We're not gonna get into any of those. But if you wanna take the first tact, if you wanna be careful with the JavaScript that you write and only use those those original features, I guess you can say, of JavaScript, or the early features of JavaScript. There's a website for you. You wanna take a look at this website called Can I Use? And so we can take a look at maybe one of the newer features of JavaScript, the let keyword. I'll type it in here uh, in the search box, Can I Use? And it will show us the let keyword, gives a quick description of what it is, and then it will show for the current versions of each of the web browsers, uh, whether it's supported or not. And you can see that the let keyword does have wide adoption across all modern web browsers with a couple of exceptions. Um, now, if you want to go ahead and use the absolute latest version of JavaScript and then take that second tact where you transpile your code so that it's com backwards compatible with as many versions of the various web browsers as possible, then you want to check out a website like and a tool actually called Babel.js. So you can find it at babeljs.io and it will, again, use a, a combination of techniques to uh, to take your code. And you can see some of uh, this little animation that's on the page right now. You can actually use this to type in some code here and see how it converts it into the older style JavaScript. And I'm not gonna cover how to use Babel in this course, uh, but you should know up front that writing JavaScript for web browsers requires that you give some careful thought to how your JavaScript will ultimately be consumed and who your targets are. And that definitely means that you're going to have to take into consideration uh, the fact that some people will be using older web browsers. The writing JavaScript that will run on a web server using a framework like Node.js is a bit easier because, well, you're going to have some some upfront knowledge about where that code will ultimately be executed. Uh, but this is not a course specifically about Node.js either, even though we're going to use Node.js uh, as a as a lightweight means of executing these little tiny JavaScript examples that we're going to create throughout this course. So you're going to learn enough about Node.js to be able to write a simple tiny application, but it won't do anything cool like serve up a web page. However, I'm sure there are other courses here on Microsoft Virtual Academy and elsewhere that will help you kind of take that next step. So the game plan uh, for this course is to start in the very next video by installing the tools that you'll need to get started. And then we're going to start with the absolute ABCs of JavaScript and programming in general. And I encourage you to follow along by typing in the code that I type in the video. Uh, and that's, you know, typing it yourself is the absolute best way to learn. It starts to develop muscle memory. You'll have many of those aha moments where you realize, oh, I see how these two things are related. You can hear it and that's one thing, but to type it in and to see it on your own computer working is something entirely different. I highly recommend that you you become an active learner by typing in the code yourself. But I encourage you also to pause and rewind the video as many times as you need. This isn't a race. You don't consume these kinds of videos the same way you would watch a TV show, a movie, or a YouTube video. Um, if something's not clear to you, don't just let it go in one ear and out the other and worry and say, oh, I'll figure it out later. No, stop down and figure it out now because you never know. It might be something foundational you'll need to know uh, in the next lesson and the next lesson. But by the end of this course, you're going to be well positioned to move on to a more advanced JavaScript course to learn how to use modern client frameworks like React and Vue and Angular. 
Uh, or you'll be well positioned to learn more about server-side framework libraries, uh, frameworks and libraries like Node.js and Express.js and others. But no matter what, you're going to have a great foundation to build on. If something I say doesn't make sense, again, I can't stress this enough, seek out other sources online. And you're going to ultimately want to know something from me. I've recorded enough of these courses. I know the questions that are already coming. You're going to ask me if there's a book that goes along with this course that I could recommend. And I'm sorry, I don't really have a specific recommendation. Honestly, my recommendation is that you exhaust the dozens if not hundreds of JavaScript online resources uh, where you can simply use them for free and find them in an instant uh, if you want to get more explanation about any given idea that are that's covered in this course. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I want to encourage you to take your time. Don't feel overwhelmed. Stick with JavaScript, stick with this course, and you're going to be well rewarded, I promise. It'll be more difficult than playing a video game, than watching a movie or reading a book, but I promise you, you're going to wind up enjoying it even more than any of those things. Even if I wasn't paid to write code, I would do it because it's fun. It's mentally challenging and you get this rush whenever you, you write code and you see it working and you're like, wow, this is awesome. So I'm glad you're going to get an opportunity to do that. It's uh, the most fun you're going to have on a computer, I promise. And uh, you'll, you'll wind up enjoying it. So stick, stick with it and I'll try to encourage you along the way. All right, so we'll get started in the next video. See you there. Thanks. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to install the tools that we're going to need for the remainder of this course. Fortunately, we don't need a lot, and everything is free. And everything I show you will work regardless of which operating system you currently have installed. So uh, regardless of whether you're using Windows, Mac, or Linux, everything I show you will be available for those platforms. Uh, the first thing we're going to need is a web browser. I'm pretty sure you already have one of those installed. Any will do. I would probably recommend that you either use Microsoft Edge or you use uh, Google Chrome. The second tool that we're going to need to install is Node. It is the uh, the JavaScript runtime. It's what will actually execute the code that we write. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. And then we're going to need an authoring tool, something where we can actually type the code in. Now, in the past, I've used Notepad to actually demonstrate because I didn't want to, like, you know, recommend one tool over the other. But then Microsoft came out with Visual Studio Code. It's available on uh, all three platforms. So it's also available for free. So no matter what you're using, you should be able to download it and follow along. Now you may already have a favorite tool for creating web pages and so forth. Feel free to use that. Uh, I'm not gonna do anything that's so Visual Studio Code specific that it will exclude you. Please follow along no matter what tool you prefer. But let me put in a good plug for Visual Studio Code. I've been using it pretty much as one of my exclusive tools in my full-time job for the last three months. And uh, it's, it's really good. So I highly recommend it. Let's get started. We're going to need Node. And you may already have Node installed. So let's just see if you do or not. Let's go and in Windows, I'm going to open up a command prompt. And I'm going to type in Node-V. If I had Node installed, it would display the version of Node that I currently have installed. I don't have Node installed on this computer, so I get an error message. That's good. So to begin, we're going to go to Node.js. I can type. There we go. Node.js.org. And again, regardless of which operating system you're using, you should be presented with an opportunity to download either the supported version or the current version which has like the latest features you don't need that just just use the lts version which is recommended for most users as long as you're using the version that i'm using or greater we should always be in sync again we're not going to use any really advanced features of node so this shouldn't really matter much i'm going to go ahead and run it run the installer here what you see next depending on uh, which operating system you're using uh, will um, you may see something a little bit different than what I see on screen, but hopefully you've installed things frequently enough that you can work your way through it. So here we have the Node.js setup wizard, and I'll just walk my way through, agree to the license. I'm going to pick a place on my hard drive to install this. 
there are some options. I'm not going to really do much of anything, but I do want to make sure that in Windows that this is added to my path. This will make sure that Node is available in any directory of my hard drive. So when I type in Node V uh, from anywhere uh, in my command prompt, it'll it'll pop up. Okay, so just make sure that everything is selected and you'll be fine. It's not that large. Next, I'm going to have to agree to um, Windows UAC. You may see something different here on the Mac or Linux. I'm going to go ahead and agree to that little security prompt. And it only takes a minute or two to install Node, and then we'll move on. But basically, Node, in a nutshell, is uh, the V8 JavaScript engine that they ripped out of Chrome. They added some tooling around it to support things for like HTTP, working with, with um, requests and responses, and with the file system, and they created one of the most robust uh, web server tools that is available today, and many large applications are using Node currently to host their applications. We're not going to use it for that. We're going to use it for something much more mundane, which is to really just write out little text messages to a console window as we get started. Then we'll graduate on and use it in web pages much later in this course. All right, so I should have it installed, right? So I come over here and it still says it's not installed. I'm going to have to reboot my computer. So let's pause. I'm going to pause the recording of the video right here. I'm going to reboot and then when I come back in, we should be able to move on from there. All right, so I've rebooted. Let's open up a command prompt, type in node-v and I can see the version number. So we're successful. The next step is to install Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is different than the full version of Visual Studio. So Visual Studio Community, Professional, or Enterprise. Visual Studio Code is a lighter weight code editor, mainly used for web development, but I know people that use it to develop C-sharp applications and other type of, of applications where you can uh, use the, the command line tools to compile your code and things of that nature. That's not something I would ever want to do. It's great for web development and that's what we're going to use it for, for authoring our JavaScript files and then executing node commands in a built-in little command window, command prompt like we see there. Again, available for all uh, operating systems. You just go to code.visualstudio.com. It should be able to detect which operating system you're currently using and it gives you a download option for that. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and run it in place. Again, Windows UAC prompts me to make sure that I am authorized to install it. We get to the, to the code setup wizard. I'm gonna go ahead and accept the agreement and we're gonna work our way through the defaults. Uh, sure, and you can see that we can also add Visual Studio Code to the path, which will become available after restart. I don't need that necessarily for this course, but hey, you know, it doesn't hurt. In fact, let's go ahead and use it for everything here. That's up to you. You can read those options and choose what you want, but for my purposes, this will work just great. And we'll see throughout this course some of the things that Visual Studio Code will do for us as we're typing our, our code. Simple things like uh, like code coloring and code completion, managing our files, giving us an environment to execute uh, command line tools like the Node uh, command line tool. And uh, there are many things like that, IntelliSense, others that will give us the tools to, to hopefully allow us to author our JavaScript code accurately. So let's go ahead and launch it. And let's just do what I call a quick smoke test. And we don't need get for this course. I'm just going to hit close on that. So what we'll do is uh, go to the Explorer. It's the little icon in the upper left-hand corner here. Let me kind of pull this out and make this a little bit sized a little bit more nicely here. Great. I'm going to close down the welcome screen. I am going to click Open Folder. And I'm going to go on... For me, I'm going to go to my C drive and I'm going to create a source folder. Now, depending on your operating system or what your preferences are, you may want to create a folder somewhere else. But create a folder because we're going to put some, some JavaScript files and later some HTML and CSS files in that folder. And we're going to want a, a folder structure. So right here in the open folder dialog, 
I'm going to right click and select a uh, new folder. I'm going to call this source lowercase s and source and then select that folder. And now that becomes the working folder that I'm going to use to add additional files and, and all the work that we do for this course inside of there. Here it doesn't really wants me to put git, install git, and I don't want to do that. What I really want to do is go to terminal, all right, and depending on which operating system is in, you're installed on, you might see something different here. In Windows, you see PowerShell. It doesn't really matter as long as you get a command prompt. And here I'm going to type node-v, and I can see that. That's awesome. And then what I want to do is add a file inside of this folder, this working folder. So I'm going to click on this little file with a plus symbol in the upper left-hand corner. I'm going to type in app.js, and it opens up a new file here in the main area with a little JS icon right next to it. And here I'm going to type all lowercase uh, console.log. Hi. I'm going to go to the end and hit a semicolon. So let's kind of walk through this. The word console, a period on your keyboard, the word log, L O G, and then an opening and closing parenthesis inside of there I want to put an opening single quote mark and a closing single quote mark and then some word I put hi you could put your first name it, it really doesn't matter but what does matter to me at least is that you end it with a semicolon uh, and as you're gonna to come to learn writing code is an exercise in precision if you don't write exactly what I write there's a chance that you will not get the results that I get. And so you want to double check and make sure there's not extra spaces. You want to double check to make sure that you're using the right characters. Like this is not a comma. It is the period on the keyboard. All right. This is not a curly brace. It is a parenthesis. Uh, this is not a double quote, although that would be acceptable. In this particular situation, I would prefer if you used a single quote, which is on the same key. You just have to hold down the shift key. All right, to get to it. All right. So now I'm going to use control S on my keyboard to save, or it might be command S if you're on the Mac or, or something else on Linux. I don't know, whatever you, you use, but, or you can just go file save. All right. Now watch what happens when I just use the space bar on the keyboard. Did you notice, see that little symbol there? It went from X to a circle. That means that file has not been saved yet. That change that I made is not saved. So here again, I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut to save it. Then I'll come back down here into the terminal. Now, how can I do this easily? Well, on Windows, the keyboard shortcut is control and then the back tick. That's usually next to the number one, kind of to the left of it on most keyboards. So the back tick will close and open up that little terminal window at the bottom. And now I can type in node space and then I want to use the name of this file. So app dot j s and hit enter on my keyboard and it should print out that word hi that i have inside of those two single quote marks in console.log all right now we can also shorten this up node space app we don't have to use the file extension and it will work as well all right so assuming that you were able to follow along and you got to this step then you're ready to move forward and we're ready to get started actually writing some JavaScript. Let's start that process in the next video. We'll see you there. Thanks. So our job as software developers is to author code, which is using a language that's human readable and author in such a way that can be understood and parsed and interpreted and ultimately then executed by a computer. And the code that we write, we save into files and we ask, uh, we ask some execution environment, whether it be a web browser or in this case, Node, to, to take a look at this, this code that we wrote in this file and to interpret it and to execute it. All right. And so it's important, first of all, as we get started, understand that how our code is going to be used. Uh, we're working and learning the JavaScript language, but ultimately 
the code that we write will be executed in, let's be honest, one of two, maybe even a third environment. We're either going to write JavaScript code that will ultimately be executed in Node, and typically when we're writing code for Node-based applications, we're writing uh, applications that can access the file system, ask, access the network, respond to HTTP requests, and provide an HTTP response, things that are more server-side in nature, all right? And then we'll also then write JavaScript code that will execute in the context of a web browser. And we would expect for that code to be able to dynamically interact with um, with elements, HTML elements on a given web page, all right? Uh, but we might also use JavaScript to uh, to write video games in an environment like Unity, for example, uh, and be able to author and control uh, the various objects on screen and, and their animation and, and their interaction and so on. So there's, what I'm trying to get at here is that there's a difference between the language itself and then the environment that it runs inside of. And we need to be aware of that, that those are two separate things, even though sometimes they feel like one thing. In this case, console, for example, the console.log function is provided to us by Node. It allows us to tell Node that we want to print something to the command line like we did just a moment ago. Now, there's also a console dot log function in most web browsers and it allows us to print little debugging messages or console messages that can only be viewed inside of a web browser whenever we have the developer tools open and we'll see how to do that much later in this course once we start building uh, web pages uh, and, and JavaScript that can interact with them. But at any rate, let's get back to the matter at hand here. If I write my JavaScript incorrectly, then the runtime, wh whether it's Node or a web browser, will, won't be able to compile it and it'll give us an error. And so JavaScript is similar to English in so much that JavaScript has a syntax and it has a proper syntax versus a syntax that's incorrect. So if you've ever taken an English, English class, you'll know that there are parts of speech that, uh, that you're supposed to use punctuation at the end of a sentence to indicate the, the end of a complete thought. There are nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs and, and prepositions and all these sorts of things, right? And so, you know, in general terms, the same thing is true with JavaScript. There are parts of speech. We'll talk about those. And so you will be learning a new language, starting with your ABCs and, and with, with, uh, I guess, uh, vocabulary words, so to speak, and then to move on to authoring sentences that are complete thoughts, and then stringing those sentences together into paragraphs in order to accomplish some higher level task, and even kind of arranging those paragraphs together to create entire applications, all right? So hopefully that analogy will serve you well as we get started here. Our goal as we get started is to author JavaScript statements. And a statement is basically just one complete instruction. Uh, it's like a sentence in English. And each JavaScript file that we create, like this app.js, it'll, it'll contain one or more uh, JavaScript statements that will execute in sequential order from top to bottom, at least usually. And I'll talk about the exception to that as we get further into this course. But there are some other similarities between JavaScript and English. For example, there's an end of line character. I was very, very specific about adding that semicolon at the end of, of our statement. And that just is an indication to the compiler that this is a complete thought and it should be carried out as is. All right. Um, now, we also see that we have our statement all on one line of code. And generally speaking, as we're getting started, we're going to write our JavaScript statements one per line. Now we'll bend those rules as some of our statements become very long. We can actually, for readability's sake, from a human perspective, we can split things up onto multiple lines if we need to. Uh, JavaScript, specifically Node, doesn't really care about that. That's really more for uh, human readability. It can deal with multiple lines or a single line for a given statement. But be that as it may, we're going to try to strive at the beginning to write one 
statement per line in our files. And a statement usually consists of one or more expressions. So uh, we'll talk about expressions a little bit later, but this particular expression is essentially just executing a function that's built into Node. It's the log function. It belongs to an object called console. We'll talk about objects and functions a little bit later here. And we execute it by using operators. Those in this particular case, this is the function invocation operator or the method invocation operator. It's those open and closing parentheses. And we can even then pass in what are called arguments to those functions. So you can see that each little piece of this has a name and it has a role to play in creating our functions. And we'll learn more about that as we move on here. One thing to note is that JavaScript is case sensitive. And this trips up a lot of people to begin with. That's why I was very specific to say, hey, don't accidentally or mindlessly use capital letters. Make sure everything is lowercase. Let's see what happens if I were to save this work that I did here with the capital C in console and the capital L in log. Let's go uh, node space app and hit enter and we get a reference error. Console is not defined. It's not defined inside of node. Console doesn't exist with a capital C inside of Node. It exists with a lowercase c inside of Node. The same thing is tr true with the function name log. Let's go ahead and I'll just use the up arrow on my keyboard. That'll give me the last um, command that was used in the, uh, in the terminal. So again, Node app, and I'm gonna try to execute this little program again, and I get another error. This time, console.capitalLlog is not a function. That's true. It's because it's lowercase l in log. And I'll save that change, and then we'll re-execute this, and it will work. Now, there are some things that, especially when your application is small, don't matter. So you might have accidentally left off that semicolon at the end, and the application still runs. But that's a bad practice to rely on that. You should always try to create properly formed sentences, even though you could write an English sentence or a text message that somebody could understand that has no punctuation, has no capital letters and things of that nature that would make it a well-formed English sentence. And you're, you're relying on your, the person receiving that text message to understand what you're trying to say. Uh, the computer doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, needs, it needs to know exactly what you're saying, and so you have to be precise. Precision is the key as a software developer. All right, so what I want to do here as we kind of start wrapping things up for this first, uh, first foray into JavaScript, I'm going to comment out this line and add some new code below it and use that as kind of the next step beyond where we're at right now. So to, uh, to tell the compiler to ignore a line of code, I'm going to add a code comment. And here I use two forward slashes. I added also a space, but that was really just for readability sake so that myself as a human, I can kind of make an easy distinction because sometimes all these characters run together. I like adding a space between this. But these two characters say, forget everything on this line of code. Don't compile it. Don't try to use it. All right. And we'll see in a moment that there's another way to create uh, code comments as well. But here, let's create something a little bit more interesting. I'm going to say let x equal 7. I'm going to say let y equal 3. Let z equal x plus y. And then we'll do console.log. And then I'm going to use uh, open and close parentheses. I'm going to use a single quote. I'm going to type in the word answer, colon, space. I'm going to go outside of that quote. So it's I'm going to go between the closing single quote and the closing parenthesis. And I'm going to make some space for myself in there. I'm going to use the plus key or the plus operator and the letter Z. I'm going to go to the end of the line and use the end of line character, the semicolon. I'm going to save it all. Now, before we actually execute this, what do you think this will do? What do you think will be printed to our console window? Do you have any guesses? Well, I'm betting that your background in math or algebra probably will lead you to the correct answer. And I think that your intuition in many cases is something that's important as you're learning JavaScript. It is human readable. 
it should be somewhat understandable. It might require a little extra explanation because there's some things that are not extremely obvious, but for the most part, this shouldn't blow you away, and nothing we cover should ever blow you away. It just might require a little extra effort than you're normally used to putting into things, but by no means impossible, right? So just take some comfort that this is well-traveled ground and that if I can understand it, I promise you can too. Let's run the application and see that we get the 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 correct result which is answer colon space and the number 10. so how do we get that well we have something here let x and even though again you're not a javascript developer you know or an advanced javascript developer just yet i'm willing to bet that you understood that we were creating a variable essentially uh, a, a bucket that could contain a value and immediately we set that variable equal to the value seven. And then we did the same thing with the value uh, of three. We put that into a different variable, a different bucket called y. And then here we have an expression, an expression that will add two values together. What are the values inside of those variables x and y? Well, we just assign them in lines three and four and we know that that probably means we're going to add those together to get the result of 10. And we assign that into a new bucket, a new variable named Z. And then we merely print out that literal string. But then we also say also append the letter or, or the value that's in Z. Now, hopefully that made sense to you even before we ran the application. But you can see here that, for example, the plus symbol has has double duty. It's it's serving to be the addition operator, but it's also serving to concatenate two values together. In this case, two string values together so that we can print it off the screen. So we're going to use this kind of as a starting point and talk about this at more length uh, in the next and subsequent videos. But hopefully up to this point, you get some comfort level you're writing some code, you're getting your hands dirty in the code, and uh, you know I know you can do this, so just keep pushing forward, and let's pick it up in the next video. We'll see you there. Thanks. In this video, I want to continue talking about line number three so that we completely come to a, a full understanding of what variables are in JavaScript. So I'm going to add a new file. And I'm going to do that by hovering over the source tab of the Explorer. And I want to type in variables.js, like so. And then uh, I'm just going to copy in the code that we had here. We'll use this as a starting point. All right, so let's focus in on line number one. Let's just, first of all, let's make sure this still runs. And let's go node. And this time we're going to give it the new file name variables and we get the same result as before. Great. So what is a variable? I think I said at the very end of that previous lesson uh, that a variable is basically just a, a uh, an area in the computer's memory where we're storing a value. We're requesting or declaring our need for a new uh, variable, a space in the computer's memory where we can put information and retrieve information. And then we can, from that point on, continue to use that variable to, to store different values and retrieve those values back out throughout the, the lifespan of the application. So there are actually several different parts to the variable declaration statement in line number one. The first is the let keyword. Uh, and let's start, start talking about the parts of speech in JavaScript. A keyword is something like let, and we'll see some other examples a little bit later, but essentially think of it like a verb in the English language. It's a, it's an instruction to the JavaScript compiler that we want to do something, that we want to take action. So we want to create a variable with the name of X, and we're expressing that intent to JavaScript using the let keyword. All right. So that's the first part of it. And then the second part is the name of the variable that we want. So we're requesting that a area of storage, uh, a unit of storage is assigned to our application that where we can put things. But how do we reference that? Again, it needs a name so that we can 
get the values and put new values in memory, all right? Uh, and so that's usually called an identifier. We want to declare a new variable with the identifier of x, and we're going to talk about naming our identifiers, naming our variables. There's some rules and some conventions that we need to follow as developers. All right, we'll come back to that at the very end of this lesson. Uh, now, before we get too far, there's actually a couple of different ways to, to declare a variable in JavaScript. The original keyword that you'll see used and used in 99% of all tutorials and articles and books and videos is the var keyword. And until recently, this was the only way that you could declare a variable. In the latest version of JavaScript, however, the recommendation is to abandon var unless you really need it use the let keyword instead, or the const keyword, which we'll talk about in just a moment. If we were to save our application using the var keyword in line number one, and then rerun it, nothing would change. So what's the problem with var? There are some, well, I guess there's, there's two ways to, to kind of explain it at this point. The first is that its usage is very nuanced. It does stuff that somebody new to JavaScript may not anticipate the ramifications of until it's too late and there are problems in code. Uh, we'll talk about the var keyword and how it relates to scope and so on uh, in an upcoming video, but we need to introduce some more concepts before we can get to the point where that discussion is even interesting, okay? Um, so its usage is nuanced and the ramifications can be uh, pretty challenging uh, if you're just getting started. So that's why the people who decided what goes into JavaScript said, why don't we introduce a new keyword called let? It will work like most other programming languages uh, as you try to learn JavaScript. Hopefully it won't be problematic. So that's why we have the let keyword. The other, uh, the other keyword for declaring a variable is const. And we use that whenever we want to express our intent to the JavaScript compiler that we do not intend for that variable to ever change its value. So what we initialize the value to, in this case, to seven, we wouldn't expect that to change throughout the lifetime of the application. And if we try to change it, like in the very next line of code, we can attempt to set it equal to six. I'll save that. Let's go over and try to run that code. We're going to get an error. And it actually is pretty helpful. It, it gives a little, a little carrot right underneath the equal sign, and it says assignment to constant variable. That's the problem. And, and the issue here is that we've said to JavaScript, we never want to change that value. And then the very next line of code, we say, yeah, uh, I'm going to s assign it a new value and set it equal to 6. And it says, can't do that. OK. So for the most part, we're going to use the let keyword most of the time because that's the recommendation now uh, in uh, as we learn JavaScript. All right, so uh, just want to point out that we can uncomment out line number two as we assign the value of x to different values. And we can keep doing this as many times as we want to. So at this point in line number one, we've declared the variable, set it to the seven, then we've assign it the value of six, then five, then four. We can keep changing the value in the computer's memory. Uh, and what is the value in line number six? What's x's value? Well, the last time we assigned a value to it, it was four. So uh, the application now, whenever we run it, will give us seven because three plus four equals seven, right? So that's what we get in line number seven. Great. All right, so uh, I guess this should be obvious at this point. The equal sign here is actually what's called an assignment operator. This is how we assign a value into a variable. And we can keep assigning values as many times as we want, but we can only declare a value or variable one time. So if I were to try and come down here and say let x equals you know 7 again, or let it equal uh, 8, I'm going to get an error. Whenever I try to run the application, the identifier x has already been declared. Again, you can only declare a variable once, but you can assign its value as many times as you want to after that. All right. So in line number one, not only are we declaring the variable, then we're also assigning its value right off the bat in the same line of code. And when we do that, it's a technique called initialization. This is actually two lines of code rolled up into one. 
lines number one and two now are roughly equivalent to what we had before. Um, well, roughly equivalent. There is one difference here. At the end of the execution of line number one, what is the value of x? Well, let's let's find out. Console.log, and then we'll just say, what's the value of x at this point? And then let's run the application. And you can see that first value that's output above what we get now in line number 11 is the term undefined. We'll explain what undefined means in more detail a little bit later, but essentially it is what it sounds like. We've declared a variable, but we've not defined it. We've not put a value into it. So it's undefined. All right. And that's generally not something we want. It might be in some cases something we need, uh, but for the most part, we won't do that. It's preferable that at the moment of declaration, you also in, uh, initialize your variables if you can. All right, so that would be valid right there. Um, all right, so now let's finish this up and talk about the rules for naming our variables. Uh, the variable name itself, I think I've already referred to this as an identifier. And so there are rules for identifier names, and then there are some code conventions. And these are not enforced by the JavaScript compiler, but are rather things that are best practices as determined by the community of software developers who've come before you. So let's talk about those things which are hard and fast rules that will actually break your application. Rule number one is that all identifiers, all variable names, have to begin with either a letter, a dollar sign, or an underscore. So that's rule number one. Rule number two is that uh, the variable names can contain letters or numbers, dollar signs or underscores, but no other special characters and you can't use a space uh, in between, you know, two words that you intend to be considered together as an identifier. Identifier can't have any spaces, all right? And then rule number three is that you can't use any keywords. So I can't do something like this. Uh, let, let <laughs> equal to eight. And if we try that, we're going to get a weird error. Let is disallowed as a lexically bound name, all right? And so it even if we were to scroll up just a tiny bit, it puts that, those carrots right underneath the let, the second one, because we're trying to use that identifier, but it's a, already a keyword, right? So you can't do that. All right, so those are your own, oh yeah, there's one other rule, and that is that variables variable names identifiers are case sensitive. So we could do this. And it would be a perfectly acceptable application. Um, these are two different variables, uppercase X and lowercase X. So if you intend to do something like this, let's see what we get here. All right, it doesn't, it doesn't blow up. So we were able to use X and assign it to eight, but we didn't declare the variable. Well, something fishy is going on and we'll get to the bottom of it before the end of this course. But the key to this is that we did not, we're not working with the same X as we're working with here. All right, so let's just get rid of that. But those are the rules. It has to begin with the letter, a dollar sign or underscore. The rest of the name can have pretty much anything including numbers, but no spaces or other special characters. Can't use any keywords for names of variables and uh, be aware that uh, variable names are case sensitive. Now there are code conventions and these again are just good practices. The first one is that variable names should be descriptive. And unfortunately, uh, X, Y, and Z are not very descriptive names. Ideally, we would use something like maybe, um, let's go down here. So let uh, first number equal seven, and then let second number equals three, and then we could use that in line number 12 instead. Uh, here's some better ones actually, like if we wanted to capture information or represent information like the first name or let zip code equals 7502 and so on all right so use names that represent the thing you're trying to store 
and it, from an application perspective, what meaning does this variable have inside of our application? Meaningful variable names. The second is camel casing. So if you are going to use multiple words, you should use this format called camel casing. And that means that the first word of your variable name should be lowercase. So the F in first is always lowercase. But then any subsequent names that we append or words that we append together should have a capital letter. So you can see that I follow this convention every single time in lines 15 through 18. Lowercase z in zip code, capital C in zip code. All right, so camel casing. Third one is to be consistent, and that is to always follow the same kind of naming convention. Um, and this would be true kind of across not just the names of, of variable names, but for every other type of identifier that we wind up creating in our application. Stay consistent, pick one style, and stay with it throughout the remainder of the application. And then the other is to not rely on case. We've already seen the danger of that. But what if I intentionally want to do let zip code equals 60459? What we've just done, while it's grammatically correct from JavaScript's perspective, uh, and those are two separate variables in line 18 and 20, we've introduced some subtle um, dissonance in the application. Now, it's more difficult for me to see that these are actually two different variables. And maybe I intended to do that, but that's poor programming practice. We might choose uh, maybe a better name like first zip code and second zip code. That might be a better way to go about that same sort of thing. Okay. So those are the code conventions and the naming rules for variables. And that's just about everything you need to know about variables. Just about. There's actually a little bit more that we need to talk about. And we'll finish up this discussion in the next, in the next video when we talk about the values that we're actually assigning into variables and their data types. And we'll talk about that next. See you there. Thanks. In this video, we're going to talk about the values that we store in variables, and we're going to talk about the types, or rather the data types of those values and why they're important. So to begin with, let's go ahead and create a new file called datatypes.js, and this is where we're going to do all of our work. And one of the things that makes JavaScript so unique when compared to other programming languages is that whenever you declare a variable, like we do here, let uh, x equal 7, uh, the variable itself does not have a data type. Only the values that we store inside the variables have the data type. So we can kind of see this whenever we're um, working with variables. Uh, we can use something called the type of operator. And this will tell us the data type that we're working with. So, well, let's go ahead and go back to here. Let x equals 7. So let's start off by just doing console.log. And then we'll say type of, all one word, lowercase, and then x. And let's save that. Save it. And uh, here I'm going to type node and then data types. And you'll see that it outputs a number. So that's one of the first data types. The X data type is a number. And a data type is really just the kind of data that we want to store. So if you want to perform math or some algebraic uh, operation, then you want to use a number. And if you want to do a yes or no, true or false uh, evaluation, then you'll want to use a boolean and if you want to display something on screen then you'll want to use a string which is basically a shorthand for string of characters and you usually represent those with single quotes with whatever string of characters you want to uh, to use inside of it so let me give you a few examples here we've already looked at number let y equal true and so then we'll do console.log type of y. And then I'll just go ahead and do z as well. Let z equals hello world. And then console.log z. 
whoops, not just Z, I want type of Z, all right? And so now let's go ahead and run this. And we can see that we get the three data types that we're currently working with, a number, a Boolean, and a string. So in the case of a number, it can be any positive or negative number. It can even have decimal values. Uh, in the case of a Boolean, it can either be true or it can be false. Those are the only two values. And then if we want to create a string, it's going to be anything inside of the single quotes. It's a literal string of characters. I literally want H-E-L-L-O space W-O-R-L-D, all right? And so those are your three of your seven basic, um, <clears throat> basic types, data types. There's also another case. Let's let A and then console.log the value of A and then console.log type of a, all right. And just to remove the confusion here, I'm going to use a multi-line comment. This allows me to avoid having to do this on every line, right? I can just do this little slash star at the top, then go down to the bottom of where I want to comment out, and then star slash. And you can see everything that's highlighted in green or, or turned to the green color is now commented out just as if I had commented out each individual line separately. So here I'm just creating a variable A, but I'm not initializing it to a value. Remember we saw, do you remember what it output when we did this before? It output uh, the value undefined, but we wanna see what the type is because we said that it's the, the value that's assigned to the variable that has a type so what is the type of a variable that has nothing assigned to it? Well, that's what we're going to get to the bottom of right now. So we see that the value is undefined and the type is undefined. So now we have four types. We have number, Boolean, string, and undefined. And there's two or three others that we're going to look at here before the, uh, before the very end. We'll get to them. They're a little bit more complex. But those are the four that we have to work with, uh, at least to start off with. And so that's all I really wanted to say. The next thing we're going to talk about very quickly is how I would convert one type into another type. How do I force JavaScript to treat a string like this, console.log, um, and then a literal string of the value 9, how do I make it treat it like the number nine? Well, we'll talk about that in the next video. We'll see you there. Thanks. In the previous video, we learned that values, not variables, have a data type and that the data type is essentially a description of what you want to do with the data. There's more to it than that, but for our purposes right now, it's essentially what we intend to do with the data. And we learned of four data types, and we'll learn about a couple more a little bit later. There's the number data type, the string, the bool, and the undefined. So let me ask you this, what happens when we need to use them together? Uh, and they don't quite work the way that we think they should. Um, what options do we have then? So uh, let's go ahead and create a new file. I'm going to call this coercion, C-O-E-R-C-I-O-N dot J-S. I think that's how you spell it. And uh, let's start off with a quick little example here. So let A equals 7. Let B equals the string, the literal string. So I want to use single quote, six, single quote. All right. And then um, let C equals A plus B. And then console.log answer. And then C. All right. Before we execute this application, what do you think is going to be output uh, when we run it? What will the answer be? All right, get that in your mind. And now let's go uh, node and coercion. And uh, looks like we don't get anything at all. Oh, I need to save it. Okay, there we go. Let's try that again. 
There we go. We get the answer 7, 6. Wait, 7 plus 6 should be 13, right? Why are we getting 76? Something I can see what's happening. It's not treating these as two numeric values. It's treating them both as string values. So it's not adding two numbers together. Somehow it's coercing that A from a string in or from an integer into a string and then concatenating together a and b so this operator the plus operator we saw how we can use it for addition but we also it plays double duty and it's the uh, string concatenation operator but moreover javascript realizes that it can't add a a number in a string those are it's like adding you know, an apple and a car together. It's not like making an apple and an orange even. these It's not like fruit salad. It's like two disparately different things. What do I do? Well, I will, I will take the numeric value and coerce it, convince it, force it against its will to become a string, and then I will concatenate the two together. So that's the notion of coercion. And most people consider that to be an evil thing or a very dangerous thing um, and others just say well it's just what happens you know it's just part of the language now what if I really wanted to perform addition on two integers well then I would need to take steps to force the string six to become an, a number so that I could then add them together. And so to do that, there's actually a special function that will force that conversion. So let me uh, change this just a little bit. And um, we already have the value b, so I'll just reuse the value b and I'll set b equal to parse int. Now, I want you to notice something. I haven't really talked about Visual Studio Code much, but one of the nice things about Visual Studio Code is that it popped up this little box called IntelliSense. And IntelliSense is just a visual cue as I'm typing to show me things that I might need to reference or things that will help me to, to find the right command or the right idea. In this case, I knew it was something parse, so I start typing in and I can then use the arrow keys to start looking. I'm like, oh yeah, there's par parse float. That would give me a number with decimal values. But this, in this case, the, the string that I want to use, I know that it will only be a value without, uh, without any decimal points. So I want to use the parse int. Now what I can do is just use the space bar or like the opening parenthesis, whatever the next logical character is to do what's called code completion. So I don't have to type everything else. Now in this case, I know that I'm going to need to use the parenthesis for reasons I'll talk about later. So I'm just going to do an open parenthesis. Well, it didn't do it for me. Well, there we, let's just go ahead and use the tab key instead. All right, so the tab key will give me what I want. Now I'm inside the the uh, parentheses and I need to pass in, first of all, the string that I want to change. So in this case, take the value of B and then I need to give it optionally what's called a radix or radix and that is essentially the base system. So if I wanted to, um, to use like a hexadecimal, I might give it six, but in this case, I'm going to give it 10 because I want to use uh, a base 10 or a decimal uh, conversion. All right. So that's a little technical, but typically if we use 10 in there, we're going to be just fine. So essentially what I want to do is take this six and based on the normal decimal system, I want to convert that into a numeric value. And then I want to continue on in lines four and five, like we had before. Let's see what we get this time. The answer is 13, just as we had hoped. All right. So the parse int is a built in function to JavaScript, and I can count on it being available in Node or in a web browser or any other implementation of JavaScript. All right, so um, I guess this begs the question, what if I try to do something kind of evil with this? So let D equal uh, parse int, and then I'm gonna use the tab key to do the code completion. And this time I'm gonna pass in a character that will not convert to a or or even a string that will not convert 
into a numeric value, especially one that's decimal. So I'm gonna save this. Well, let's go ahead and console.log it. And D. And so let's go to that, and then we'll do this. All right, and I get NAN, which represents not a number. It's not really an error, it's just telling us that the value we passed in is not a number. Um, we could actually do something along these lines as well. Um, let E equals is NAN. And then I can give it some numeric value. In this case, I'll give it D. And I'll do console.log E. So let's save that, run it again. And so this time, now I'm evaluating whether D is not a number. And that is true. It is not a number because I can see it here that's printed out, all right? So we saw two built-in functions, but there's a bunch of built-in functions for various things, uh, all kind of centered around, in this case, just working with coercion and checking the results of that attempt to, to coerce or, uh, or convert one data type into another, all right? Unfortunately, there's no parse Boolean, so you can't take a string of true or false and convert it into a Boolean. You'll have to take a few extra steps. There's a bunch of, of examples online for that. And so depending on the type of conversion that you're attempting to, to perform, um, it may not be easy to convert from one to the other. There's always a way, and usually you can find some code online, especially on a site like Stack Overflow that will help you figure that out. But that's all I wanted to say. Let's continue on in the next video. We'll see you there. Thanks. In this video, I want to refocus on the JavaScript syntax specifically and uh, the various parts of speech inside of a properly formed uh, statement in JavaScript. So I started by explaining JavaScript by saying that you write statements, each of which are executed sequentially. Uh, and statements are complete thoughts, complete instructions to the JavaScript compiler of what we want it to do for us. And I said the statements are made up of one or more expressions and that an expression is made up of operators and operands. And I just made that statement in passing and kind of blew past it really quickly. Um, but I wanted to take a few moments and explain why that is an important statement whenever we're setting out to write code. And so we've already looked at uh, a couple of different operators. If we're thinking about the most atomic level of our JavaScript statements, we're thinking about in terms of operators and operands. So operators are things like keywords. We've already looked at the addition operator using the plus symbol. We looked at the string concatenation operator using the plus symbol. So that one is doing double duty uh, and, and it will be understood based on the context of how it's being used. And then there's the assignment operator, the equal sign that we've already looked at. And soon we're gonna look at a few other common ones just to start building out a list of operators that we can use to do more interesting things inside of our application. But there's also an operand. So operators are things like keywords and those various symbols that we've already looked at and we'll add more. Operands are something like identifiers, uh, a variable name. We'll, we'll learn about functions soon and functions are another type of operand. And so Unlike keywords and operators in JavaScript, which are fixed and part of the language, we, you and I, programmers, give operands their name. And so by combining operators and operands, we create expressions that are then used to compose statements. And so sometimes it's easy to spot an expression, and then sometimes it's not so easy. But identifying several major categories of expressions uh, we can better understand why JavaScript works sometimes and why it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, so for example, in the English language, we cannot write a sentence, a proper sentence like this, the dog, period. If we said, hey, uh, the dog, 
some our friend would say, what are you talking about? The dog did what? Which dog? You know, give me some more information, right? Why is that not a proper sentence in English? Because it didn't have enough inside of it to be considered uh, proper. We have a noun, we have the dog, but we don't have any verbs or adjectives or adverbs describing or, or um, you know, kind of giving us more detail about the dog. The same thing is true with JavaScript. So we can't, for example, and let me just create a quick file here. We'll call this expressions.js. So we cannot do something like this in our program, right? Uh, because the JavaScript compiler will say, okay, what do you want me to do with that? Uh, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. I don't know what you want me to do with A. I don't see it. It's not one of my variables. You're not asking me to create a new variable. There's nothing inside of A. A means nothing to me, all right? So at a minimum, we're gonna need to either, and these are the types of expressions at, at a very high level. We're gonna either declare a variable, so we would do something like this once again, let A, all right? And even in this little tiny um, uh, two word line of code, there's already an operator and an operand. Here's the operator, the let keyword, and here's the operand, a name we want to give to a new variable that will be created in memory. All right, so that's one type of expression. We're gonna call this um, types of expression. Here, we'll just use some comments. Types of expressions. Number one, variable declaration. I think I spelled that right. All right, so let's go ahead and just move that up to the very top and say, this is bad. <laughs> uh, and then we'll do something like this. I kind of like doing some ASCII art there whenever I create lists inside of my code. All right, so there we go. The other one is to assign a value. So the other type of expression, we can assign a value. So A equals three or four. Uh, and then another type of expression is to perform an evaluation that returns a single value. And so that might be something like, and if we're talking purely about the expression itself, it might be something like that, B plus C. So in a more interesting example, uh, we might do something along these lines. Um, and I'll just comment this out because I want to reuse a, there we go, good. All right, so here we go. Line number 16, I'm gonna go let um, B equals three, let C equal two, and then let A equal B plus C. Now, I just wanna focus on line number 19. And I want to say that there are three expressions in here. Can you find them? All right. Well, let's identify them. So number one, we're going to see that uh, let A, so that's a, a variable declaration. The next thing that's going to happen is we're going to perform an evaluation of B plus C right, and that will basically add those two values together because we're using the addition operator. And then finally, we'll do um, the result of B plus C is assigned to A. So three expressions all combined into a single statement, and there's a lot more going on than meets the eye, but that is the kind of thinking that will help you understand why your JavaScript code works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. You have to think in terms of writing uh, expressions that do things to form properly formed JavaScript statements. All right, so hopefully that little lesson in syntax is helpful. Let's talk about operators and the different types of operators. And, and again, we've used this collection of five or six operators so far. Let's, let's add to that collection. I'm gonna go uh, create a new file called operators.js. And so um, there are several categories of operators, and I'll just kind of go through them really quickly here. So there's assignment, 
like the equal sign. It's really the only one in this category, but it's a pretty important one and we've seen it used quite a bit. Uh, there's maybe some other keywords and things that can fall into this category, sort of, but the assignment operator is usually the only one in this category. Then there's uh, arithmetic, with which, as you might uh, suppose, would allow you to do mathematical style operations. So that's the plus, where we're adding two numbers together, subtraction, multiplication, that's the asterisk key over the eight on most keyboards. Um, there's also the division, all right? And uh, then there are some special ones like, um, let's call these, and I'll, they're kind of arithmetic, but I'm gonna call them uh, increment, decrement. So um, this is the plus plus and the minus minus. And used out of context, these don't seem so interesting, but what we could do is, for example, um, let's go var a equals one, a plus plus, and then console.log a, all right? Let's save that and then go over to our terminal and I'm gonna do uh, node operators. All right, and so you can see that we increment the value of a. So let's do this. Let's now increment it one more time and see, and let's save our work here. And then let's run it again. And wait a second, the value is still two. How is that possible? Let's do this. Let's console log a, like that. So now we're gonna print the value out twice. We're going to print it out I thought maybe we would get three, but we didn't. But if we print it out a second time, let's see what value we get. And so when we print it out the second time, we get three. And the reason is this, because this operator, this increment operator works after the line or after the value is already utilized inside of this line of code. So basically, hey, console.log, here's A, and after you print that to screen, then let's add something to it. That's why we're able to see the new value if I print it a second time, all right? What we may have preferred instead of this is to go console.log and put the plus plus before the A. That means I want you to first evaluate the increment of A and then print it to the console.log. All right, so let's save that. Let's rerun this, and now we see three in both cases. The same would be true with the decrement, where we could subtract either before or after the evaluation of that variable. All right, just something to keep in mind. All right, so that's increment and decrement. Um, there's also, going back to arithmetic, there's the modulus. And this will give me uh, the, uh, the remainder amount. So let's go um, var m for modulus equals 10 divided by, whoops, 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 that's not what I wanted, 10 modulus 3, and then I want to console.log m. And just to kind of keep everything clean, I'm going to comment out all this as well. Keep it around for posterity, but otherwise, that's all I want to see. What will I get back from this, this statement? and I get one. What is one? It's the remainder. So 10 divided by three equals three with one left over. That one is the modulus, all right? And actually, this becomes a lot more interesting and important when we're looping through lots of values and every like 10th or 20th or 100th item, I wanna print a little message to screen to say, hey, we finished processing the, the 10th the 20th, the 30th, the 40th, the 50th item, all right? And I use that actually frequently, so I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of modulus. Let's comment that out. So uh, moving on to the different categories of operators, uh, let's talk about uh, the various string operators. And we've already seen these. So this is gonna be like the literal string operator. We're using single quotes. And then also we saw the string concatenation operator that will take two strings and, and allow them to be appended together to create one new string. Um, other operators, uh, precedence. So we might, uh, you know, order of operations, we actually use this quite a bit, um, even in non-mathematical situations. 
So, for example, um, let's just do uh, var b equals uh, 1 plus 2 times 3. Now, if you're coming from an algebra background, there's an order of operations where things should be done in a certain order. And I'm pretty sure, if memory serves me correctly, it's been a long time since I've had an algebra course, but you perform algebra before you perform addition. So, if I were to do a console.log here, I would expect b to output 2 times 3 plus 1, so that would be 7. Let's see if my my memory serves me correctly here and yes it does but what if that's not what I want well I can use just like in algebra I can use parentheses to kind of control the order in which things are evaluated um, so in this case I would do 1 plus 2 first and then multiply that by 3 which will give me a completely different result of 9 because 3 times 3 equals 9 okay so we'll use this uh, the um, the opening and closing parentheses for different purposes. Uh, for example, um, whenever we want to do console.log, these parentheses are also used as the, um, the function invocation operators. All right. And that just says, here's a function name called log. And we'll learn about functions soon. But I want to actually invoke the function now and I can even use the function invocation operators the opening and close parentheses to pass in arguments and we'll talk about that a little bit later but again that is the open and close parentheses um, there are other operators uh, and I'll just um, put them here they may not make a lot of sense at the moment but they will soon when we look at decision statements so there's the logical if I'm sorry, the logical and and the logical or, okay? So when I want to add two things together and evaluate two things together, either one of them needs to be true or both of them needs to be true. And we'll look at that in, in a little while. Um, there's also the member accessor operator. So when we did console.log, if you look at IntelliSense as I hit the dot on the keyboard, there's that period. Why are we using a period there? That allows me to access the various members of this object. And we'll talk about object, and we'll talk about uh, properties and functions or methods of objects soon. But that's what allows me to access the log function of the console object inside of jo JavaScript. So here again, comment that out. but. We'll use the period for that purpose. We're going to also look at the code block operator soon. And so, you know, I'm going through all these and I'm saying, hey, we'll look at these soon. Really, the point of this exercise is to say that there's lots of operators and we're going to have to begin to identify what all these special characters are. And the only way to do that is to, first of all, learn that they exist, what their function is, and then use them as we're writing programs. Uh, and so um, I think that's really the only thing I wanted to say. I mean, let me just put one more in here. The array element access operator goes by different names, but I'm just going to use that. And so we'll use square brackets for that purpose. So almost every single character, the special characters that are uh, above our numeric values and we can access using the shift key uh, and the various ones that are usually on the right hand side of the keyboard the various braces and brackets and colons and semicolons and and um, all of these are 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 used to, uh, to um, uh, for various purposes in JavaScript uh, and in most programming languages alright so I think that's all I really want to say uh, let's pick back up in the next video. You're doing great. Hang in there with me. We're getting through uh, some of the easy stuff, and we're going to start moving on to some challenging stuff here really quick, but you're doing great. See you in the next video. Thanks. Up till now, each variable that we create can store one value at a time per variable. But what if we need to work with lists of data? In other words, I need to keep track of several people or several numbers 
and I need to store them in such a way that uh, it doesn't matter if I have two or 10 or 100, I can kind of keep them together and move them all around and use them in my application as a list, as a grouping of related values. In that case, I want to create an array. And so let's start by creating a new file called arrays.js. And first of all, it's basically, an array is basically a variable that can hold many different values. And so we can uh, declare variable and initialize its value like so. Uh, so here we'll do let a equals. And here we're gonna use an opening and closing square brace or bracket. And then I'm gonna give it a series of values. Each value will be separated by a comma. For eight, um, let's say 15, 16, 23, and uh, 42. All right, and so now I have an array of those values. Now these are just numeric values. What if I wanted to create an array of string values? I can do something similar. In fact, I can use any data type inside of here uh, that's allowable in JavaScript, and we'll see some examples of that a little bit later. But I might want David, Eddie, Alex, and uh, Michael. All right. And then what if I want to get one of the, the values? I can just do console.log. All right. Inside of here, I'm going to use the variable name. So in this case, I'll use A. And then I'll want to provide a index to retrieve one of the elements. So each of these is an element of the array. And I want to use an index, a numeric value that that allows me to get at one of those elements inside of the array. Uh, the indexes are zero base. That trips up beginners sometimes. Uh, you, for example, to get at the number four, the first element in the array, I would use the index zero. If I want the second item in the array, the second element of the array, I would need to use the index one and so on. So to get at it, I'm going to use A and then right next to the A, square brackets, and then I'm going to give it an index. So here we'll grab the first value and then I'll grab the second value. All right. And then I want to do show you how console.log will just print out all of the values for you nicely if you just want to give it the name of the uh, of the array itself, the, the variable itself. So let's save our work and um, we'll go uh, node arrays. All right, so you can see the first element of the array at index zero gives us the value four. The second element of the array at index one gives us the value eight. All right, hope you can see the correlation there. Or if I just wanna print out all the values in the array, I can just provide the variable name that contains the array and it will print them out all for me just like I have kind of here when I actually initialized our array variable. All right, let's comment this out. Now that is how we access individual elements. What if I wanted to change or set the value of one of the elements? The same would, would work. So in this case, I would say, for example, a zero and I would set it equal to seven like so. And so then we can just do console.log uh, like so, and then we run our application. Now you see the first element of the array has been changed from four to seven because that's how we can access a single element and assign it a new value. All right. All right. So um, what about these mysterious, uh, these mysterious arrays? What is their data type? So uh, let's do console dot log type of a and we can see that it's of type object and we'll talk about the object data type later because there's a lot more to it than just being able to create arrays but it's a little bit more advanced at this point we'll get into it soon just keep in mind that an array isn't a data type of itself it is a type of something called object, and we'll talk about objects later, all right? Um, so the other thing that's important to remember is that a array can, in, can include elements of different data types. So let me just do uh, let C equals 
Um, we'll start it with four, and then we'll do Alex, <laughs> and then we'll do true. All right, so we've used three different data types right there, and we can just do uh, node arrays. Oh, I need to actually do a console.log C. There we go. There we go. All right, so you can see that a single uh, array can hold different data types. There's no restriction there. Let's comment that out. What happens if I try to access an element that with an with a index that does not exist? So let's do console dot log, and I happen to know that the B has four different elements in it, four names, and let me try to access the fifth element by using the index four. And this will be undefined. So just like a variable without any value um, assigned to it is undefined, so is a element of an array undefined if we don't give it a value. Now, I can also just programmatically determine the number of elements in an array by using a special property called length. So I can do console.log a dot, and remember the dot is the member access operator. So arrays are objects, and this particular object has a special property called length, which will give me the number of elements in that array. So I would expect to see, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the question is, is it going to give us six, the actual number, uh, or is it going to give it, us to it in a zero-based fashion? And the answer to that is that it will give us the actual number, not zero-based. And this will come into, uh, into play a little bit later when we use the length of an array and we uh, uh, iterate through each element of the array to print them to screen when we learn about looping. All right, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Now, there's a lot of strange things that you can do with, with arrays, and some of them are not always intuitive. Like, for example, if I wanted to just randomly create a new element, so in this case, I'm going to create, what, the... Um, uh, use the index 10, which means this would add an 11th element to the array. What happens with all of the elements between uh, where we left off? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 6 through 11, what will we get? So let's just assign this to 77, and then I want to do a console.log of a, and then I want to do a console.log and a dot length, like we just learned about, and kind of see what happens here. And then let's run that. All right, so we can see that it prints out four, five, six, seven, or I'm sorry, four, eight, 15, 16, 23, 42. And then it says there's four empty items and then there's 77. And it says that there's 11, uh, there's 11 items, 11 elements in this array because we filled up the 10th index or index 10 with a value. So it will create essentially what's called a sparse array. And that means that there are empty elements inside. Now this isn't usually the way that you want to work with arrays if you need to add new values because it's not as safe. We're inadvertently creating elements with nothing in them. There's a safer way to go about this using some additional built-in uh, functions of the array. And so if I wanted to add that value and add it to the end of the array, no matter how many elements are currently in the array, I could use the push method. And so I say, hey, I want to push the number 77 to the end of the existing array. So let's, um, let's copy this and paste it here. And then if I wanted to remove it, I can use a method called pop. So uh, this function pop will remove the last element of the array. In fact, I can call it several times to keep removing elements of the array. And here we'll just print out what the end result is, just like we did previously. So now this should put some fireworks uh, into our terminal window. So you can see that using 
push in line number 29, I was able to add the number 77 to the end of the existing array. Uh, and that gives me seven total elements. Now I call pop three times. It removes 77, 42, and 23, leaving us with just four elements in our array. Okay. So we're going to continue to use arrays. They're a great way to, to keep lists of things together and accessible, and they'll become even more important, again, as we learn how to loop through arrays and uh, to evaluate each element. We can even use arrays to hold on to other things like, like objects and functions, and we'll learn about some advanced use cases uh, with arrays a little bit later. All right, so that's all I have to say about arrays. Let's move on and start uh, looking into some things that are beyond the absolute basics. We'll start moving and talking about functions. All right, see you there. Thanks. Throughout this course, even from the very first line of code that we wrote, we use the console.log function to print things to our terminal window. And I kept referring to log as a function as part of the console object. In its simplest form, a function is merely a block of code that we as programmers can name. And once it has a name, then we can call it by its name. But it's just one or more lines of code that we put into a block and then we say we want to execute that block over and over and over again throughout our application. So Again, that's a very basic explanation of what a function is, but in JavaScript, funct functions can do so much more. In fact, most of this course will be devoted to working with functions because, frankly, they're one of the primary constructs in JavaScript for getting things done. So first of all, uh, let's go ahead and create a new file. I'm going to call this function declarations.js. All right. And first of all, if I have some code that I want to reuse throughout my application, I want to add it to a function. So we can create a function and I'll walk through and explain the parts of a function here in just a moment. Um, let's create the most basic function that I can possibly think of. And I'm actually going to copy and paste some code in so we don't have to type it all. But nothing here should be all that revolutionary. Uh, so I've created a new function called say hello. Notice my name. I use camel casing, right? In order to name my identifier, my function name. All right. And then I have three lines of code. Notice that they're inside of these curly braces. Notice that they're indented. So we see kind of a relationship between this code on the inside and this line of code and this line of code on the outside. So it kind of uh, represents a container relationship. This code sits inside of, or is part of, or is rather the body of the function that we've just declared. All right, so um, here we just declared a simple function. This is called a function declaration, this style. We're gonna look at other ways to define functions later and I'll draw your attention and why you'd wanna choose one or the other later. There's at least two other ways that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. But first of all, notice that we use a keyword called function. Then we give the function some identifier that we come up with, something meaningful. We'll use similar rules to what we use for variable names. All right. Then we use an open and close parenthesis. You'll see how these will be used in a little bit to define arguments or par input parameters to our function. But right now it's empty. We don't require that the caller give us any additional information. Uh, and then we use the open curly brace here and the close curly brace here to define the container, to define the code that we want to be the body of this function. And everything inside of that is just any JavaScript that we want to write for the most part. All right, so uh, how do we actually then use this? Well, we gave this block of code as defined by the open and close curly brace, we gave it a name, and so we should be able to call it by its name. So I should be able to do something like this, right? Say hello. And that will get me most of the way there, but to actually invoke a function, we have to use the function invocation operator. In this case, it's the open and close parentheses, and obviously we want to use our end of line statement here. So let's go uh, node and then 
function declaration. And let's see. Oh, declaration, sorry. There we go. All right, and we get hello. So hopefully you weren't expecting something uh, super interesting. We're just printing out three lines with uh, what I would call a flower box kind of around it, some dashes to, to style it up a little bit. Um, we can do some interesting things with regards to assigning the function to a variable. So let's do let a equals say hello. Now, do I want to invoke the function here? No, and I'll explain why in a little bit. I merely want to get a reference to the function, and then I'll do um, a and invoke the variable. So this variable is now pointing to this function, and now I say, okay, I have a function inside of this variable. Go invoke it using the function invocation operators. In fact, here, let's do it a bunch of times just to make sure that uh, we're seeing what we think we should see here. And so we can see hello, 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 all three times in a row. Great. So let's comment that out. Now up to now, this function's not all that interesting. Let me just copy it and I'm gonna comment it out and I'll create a new version of this function down here beginning in line 17. And I want it to actually pass, allow me to pass in a name so I can say, hello, Bob, hello, Steve, right? So we'll just create a new argument into our function, say hello, by giving it a variable name. So essentially, now we're able to use this variable name in the body, and we expect the caller to give us the name it wants us to say hello to. So um, here I'm just gonna use some string operators here with name and make sure things are spaced nicely. And so here I can do, um, whoops, say hello to Bob. Say hello to Beth. Say hello to Mr. Tibbles, my cat. All right, and let's go ahead and run it. And you can see now how I'm able to reuse that code, but change it up by passing in the name that I wanted to say hello to, all right? So let's comment all this out. And let's talk about one more thing that we can do with functions, and that is return values from functions. So this first uh, function that we created, it's merely just outputting. We're not expecting it to, to perform some operation and then give us some value back. But what if I wanted to create a more interesting function that implements some business rule in my system, in my e-commerce system, like to calculate the sales tax on uh, a given amount, um, say a subtotal of all the items that are in my shopping cart. I might create a simple function called um, calculate tax, like so, and We'll get to the body in just a moment, but I want to allow the caller to pass in the amount that we're gonna charge tax to, all right? Then I'm gonna say let result, just the name of a variable result, uh, be the amount that value passed in times um, 0 0.0825, which is the sales tax where I live. And then I wanna use the keyword return and then the value I want to return. So you can return one value from a function. In this case, I want to return the amount of tax. So I'm going to return result. Now what I'll do is I'm going to call calculate tax, passing in an amount. So let's say $100. And I want to capture that into a variable. I know it's going to return uh, a value to me. So let's just do um, let, and I can reuse the variable word result, but I might use something more descriptive like let tax equal calculate tax, and then console.log the amount of tax, like so. Let's save that, and then let's run it. And you can see that for a $100 purchase, it would charge $8.25 in tax, okay? But that's what the 
purpose of the return keyword is to actually give me back something. So this is an expression, a function invocation expression. It's going to give me a value back that I can then assign to the new variable tax. And then I can work with that, that value in this case in a, uh, a number representing the amount of tax. All right, and I think that's all that I'm going to say about this for now, but there's lots to say about functions. It's going to, again, consume the majority of this course, and you're going to have to become very familiar with the ins and outs of working with functions, and we'll start that process in the next video. We'll see you there. Thanks. In the previous video, we learned how to create a function declaration. And a function declaration and a variable declaration are similar in so much that they both have an identifier or a name because we plan to call them later on in our JavaScript. But what if we don't need a name? What if we're in a situation where there's just a need for a function, but that function will never get called for the rest of the application? We know that. Uh, then we can take a different tact. We don't need to add a new identifier, we can just create what's called a function expression, and we don't have to supply a name. We just give it the body of the function and say, here, go do this when you need to run some code. All right, and a good, explain uh, good use of that is uh, whenever we need to create some code that should run in the future. So here, let me start off by creating function uh, expressions.js, a new file. And here I want to use the set timeout method that's available inside of JavaScript. And if we use IntelliSense, we can see that there's actually two input parameters to this function set timeout. We're going to first of all need to give it something called a handler, which I happen to know is just a function. Now I could give it a function declaration, but usually people just create function expressions here for the handler. And then the second thing we'll need to do, and I'll use the down arrow to move from the first argument to the second argument, is to give it a timeout. Uh, and so that's the number of milliseconds that I want it to wait before executing this code. And I'll show you how that might be interesting in just a few moments here. But the first thing we need to do is create a function expression to pass in. So just here right in line, I'm going to create a function open close parentheses, open, close, curly braces, which denote the body of this expression I'm creating. Inside of here, I'm going to do something simple like console.log. I waited two seconds. <laughs> and then here at the very end of the function declaration, I'm going to give it that second argument, the number of milliseconds that I want to wait before executing that function that function expression. So I'm going to say wait two seconds and then I want you to call this inline function I'm creating and the body of it will merely just log out I waited two seconds. All right so here we go. Let's go and uh, do node and then function expressions 1 1000 to 1000 and you can see it prints to screen I waited two seconds all right now it's kind of hard to read it like this all in line one of the things in JavaScript that's a little bit challenging especially if you're getting started is the number of curly braces that you'll encounter and differentiating for example this outer set of parentheses and this inner set of parentheses and and visual studio code tries to help you like when i put my caret right next to that opening curly brace it tries to find the matching closing curly brace and you'll see as we add more curly braces for different purposes and indentation levels inside of our application visual studio code does a pretty good job most of the time of finding its match it's just a matter of looking for that carrot that surrounds the closing one here over you can see whatever um, uh, in column number 61 here I'm looking at the the bottom okay uh, anything inside is just the body of the function and the same rules apply whoops I didn't use a semicolon at the end of that line but I should have all right it shouldn't change the function in this simple case but nothing changes about how we work with this now 
To be honest, most people do not put this much code on a single line. I may want to split this up into multiple lines. So I would do this in a way that feels natural to me. And you can see that as I put my mouse cursor next to where I feel like the split should have been, like at the beginning of console.log, and here at the end of our body of our function expression, Visual Studio Code naturally will create some indentation. Now, if I don't like that level of indentation, I'm free to come in here and, and to change it up. Like I would prefer to use a tab here. So I'm using the tab key on my keyboard to move things out and the shift tab to move things back. That only works if my mouse cursor is here right at the beginning of that line. If I were to move one character in and use the tab key, well, that's, you know, that's not what I want at all. That's going to split that word up. But if I use the keyboard, the arrows on the keyboard to maneuver, and then the shift tab to move it out, I can move things in and out. But that is pretty much how I would like to see that function represented, right? And then I use a comma to pass in a second argument, in this case, the number of milliseconds to my set timeout function. All right, so, but the, fo the, the focus of this is that function expression. I never want to use that function again, but I need it in this case as an argument to pass into my set timeout function. All right, so functions can take functions as input parameters, okay? So uh, just keep that in mind because things are gonna get a lot crazier than that. And let's move on and talk about um, using both the function declaration and a function expression to do something just a little bit more interesting here. Same basic uh, idea here, um, but what I want to do is start off with a counter. And this will count the number of times that we actually execute our, uh, our function expression. I'm going to start with a function on the outside, function timeout. Let's call this function timeout, like so. And then inside, I'm going to set timeout using that built-in function to JavaScript and pass in a new function expression. All right. And then I'm going to here give set timeout. Say in two seconds, I want you to basically run this function expression that I've defined right there. So I pass in the second argument of 2000. Again, you, using Visual Studio Code to help me find the matching set of parentheses at the beginning and the end to pass in uh, the uh, input parameter to the set timeout function. Recognizing that the function expression is the first argument to that, and 2000 is the second uh, input parameter to that set timeout function. Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to append, so I'm going to put a little space there between high and the closing single quote mark, counter. But I want to, after every time I reference counter, I want to increment it by one. So this will allow me to count the number of times that set timeout has run. Now one of the things that I want to do is after I have printed that line, I'm going to schedule the next time that this code should run. So I'm going to schedule and call timeout in a recursive manner. So I'm using the name of this outermost function and saying, hey, uh, now that you've run me, run me again in two seconds because I'm going to basically call set timeout again. All right, now I need to kick this off the first time. So we'll call set timeout once here on line number 15. And that will kick things off. And then I'm gonna hit control and C on my keyboard to stop the execution because it'll just keep looping and looping and looping. All right, hopefully in your mind, you understand the sequence of events here. I'm going to call this function declaration once the body of that function will create a set timeout in two seconds I want to execute this function expression 
which will not only show me the number of times that this function has been called, because I'm keeping count of it in that counter variable, but then also it's going to call the timeout function again, which will schedule two seconds from now the next call to the set timeout function. Okay, so let's see it run. Hopefully this all makes sense. So I waited two seconds, saw it run once. All right, it's so twice, three times. And you see, it'll just keep going every two seconds until I hit Control C on my keyboard to stop its execution. All right. All right, the last thing that I want to show you now, I'm going to comment all this out, is that you can create a function declaration, or I'm sorry, a function expression that says something like uh, console dot log and uh, I'll make something a little bit more interesting later and then I can immediately invoke that function by first of all surrounding this function expression in parentheses just to kind of say hey I want to group all this together and then using another set of parentheses as the function invocation operator like that do you see that format so there's this inner set that we use just to define input parameters. We don't need any, but we still need it in order to create a function expression. Then we're going to group this whole thing together and say, I want to execute it. So there's actually, what, four sets of parentheses. We just have to keep them straight in our mind of what each of them are doing. But this last set will do what's called, and this kind of structure is called an immediately invoked function expression. In other words, I will have a function expression and I want it to be invoked, I invoked immediately when this application is run. And this actually is a pretty common pattern in JavaScript development. It comes in super handy and we'll talk about why it comes in handy a little bit later. But we want to just remember immediately invoked function expression. It's also just known as an IIFE. Sometimes I think it's pronounced iffy. All right. So keep in mind iffies and we'll come back to them a little bit later. All right. So let's move on and uh, move away from functions just for a little bit. We'll come back to them later. Uh, but hopefully you can now tell the difference between a function declaration and a function expression. Most importantly, for our purposes, you want to keep in mind what immediately invoked function expressions are. Okay. All right. So we'll come back to this and uh, let's move on. See you in the next video. Thanks. In this video, we're going to talk about decision statements. There's actually three that we're going to consider. Uh, the if, the switch, and a ternary operator. Um, and so whenever we need to add logic to our application, in other words, perform different blocks of code based on some condition that we evaluate, we'll want to use one of these decision statements. And so let's go ahead and start by creating a new file called uh, decisions.js. And here what we'll do is start with the if statement. So the basic structure looks like this if and then we'll evaluate something here some expression so let me just kind of start off with this some expression that expression should equal true or false and there's lots of ways to evaluate this we'll come back to it in just a moment but we'll consider those in between the opening and closing parentheses if that is true whatever that expression is then we'll execute all the code inside so uh, let's begin simple var count equals three we'll just hard code a value and then say um, so if count and then we'll use the equality operator so this is going to evaluate for equality if count indeed is equal to four then we will uh, th that will that expression will return true if it's true then we'll perform whatever code we write here so uh, console.log and uh, count is four. So the first time we run this, we're not going to get really anything. All right, so the first time we run this, we're going to not get anything. It'll just exit. Um, what we can do is change this to count equals three, like so. And now when we run it, we'll see the message count is three. 
All right, very uninspiring. Let's set this back to four. And here we can consider the alternative that the count is not equal to four. And we could kind of give the counter message. Count is not four. This much we know to be true, all right? All right, so count is not four. We basically skipped over this block of code because this returned false. Therefore, we executed the else statement, this second block of code, and skipped over the first one, okay? So there's actually several different variations of this we can use um, because there are some different conditions here. Uh, maybe I don't want to jump right to that else statement. Maybe I want to keep evaluating. I can use an else if. And so here I might say, um, else if the count is greater than four, then I could maybe do a message like console.log uh, count is greater than four. And I can do kind of the opposite as well, else if count is less than four. So console.log count is uh, less than four. I guess I changed modalities there. And then at that point, this will never happen ever because one of these three conditions would occur. We'd never get to this final else statement, right? It would just would never happen. So let's go and save our work here and see this run. Count is less than four because it's three. Okay, so that's the general structure of the if statement. It allows us to evaluate one or more expressions. If it returns, if that expression returns a true, then we execute the code in the code block associated with that expression. We can create optional else or else if statements to continue to evaluate other expressions. Usually you'll want to make related ones, but you don't necessarily have to, although that may not make a whole lot of sense, depending on your business rules. And then we can finally use a catch-all in case none of the previous else if statements uh, are, are correct and kind of capture that. So let's go ahead and comment that out. That's our first structure and we'll use the if statement a lot. The next type of statement is a switch. It's a little bit more tricky to use. Um, Let's start off with uh, just typing out the switch keyword and what we want to evaluate. And so what we'll do is actually evaluate whatever's in this expression against a number of cases. So I might, for example, let hero equal Superman. And then depending on the hero, I might want to print out the, um, the superpowers that that particular hero has. So based on the hero, if that hero so if the case is Superman, I would say, well, that hero has console.log um, super strength. Uh, may also have x-ray vision. All right, let's add another case here and say case uh, Batman. And notice that kind of the, the format of this to use the case keyword inside of this block that belongs to the switch, the case keyword, the value we want to compare uh, our, our case against, and then a semicolon and everything beneath that will become part of the body of that, of that case that gets executed. So in this case, we'll say, what are Batman's superpowers? Um, he has intelligence, and he has uh, fighting skills. All right, and then we can also then say, well, the default for that hero is that, um, they're a member of the JLA. Now watch how this works. It works a little bit different than the if and else if. 
Um, so let's go ahead and save what we have and then rerun this. All right, so in this case, it was Superman. And notice that we matched the case Superman because it prints out super strength and x-ray vision. But then everything else inside of all additional cases, including the default case, will be true as well. So he also is intelligent, he has fighting skills, and he's a member of the JLA. Now if we were to change this to, let's say, Batman, and we were to run the application, you'll notice that it skips over all of the console log statements that describe Superman's superpowers, and they, they come in, however, here at Batman. So console log intelligence and fighting skills, and he's also a member of JLA. Now we could try somebody like a Green Arrow, not particularly one of my favorite heroes and um, he's just a member of the JLA. All right, now if we don't want that, that flow through style, what we can do is actually use a break statement in here. So let's go back through this now and see what happens whenever we break out of a given case. So back to Superman, and now when we run it, we only see that he has super strength and x-ray vision, Batman has intelligent fighting skills, and then um, Green Arrow is just a member of the JLA, okay? All right, one other quick tip here is that whenever you're evaluating strings, um, there's a possibility, like for example, Batman. What if we had capital B in Batman, all right? And then we run the application and you see he's a member of the JLA. Uh, why didn't it catch the case Batman? Because capital B, Batman, is not the same as lowercase b, Batman, in that string. Now, what we can do to circumvent that, whenever we're working with strings and we want to do some comparison with them, we can use the to lowercase method of our strings, so strings, have a built-in method called to lowercase, and that will take whatever that input is, and it will make sure that all the letters are lowercase so that we're really comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So now when we rerun the application, we get what we would expect with Batman, okay? All right, so let me comment this out. We've looked at the if statement, we've looked at the switch, and then the third one we're gonna look at is the ternary operator, and this is useful whenever I want to um, I want to just do a quick inline evaluation of some expression and then return back a value, a string, number, boolean, whatever, probably just a string or a number, back uh, depending on whether that expression evaluates a true or false. Very small, short, concise inline uh, statement. So I'm going to create two variables. I'm going to do something a little bit different though. The first variable I'll create like you would normally expect, but instead of ending that line and moving to the next one, I'm going to do another uh, variable creation. Uh, variable declaration and um, assignment right here in the same line. So I'm going to create another variable called b and initialize its value to the string one. All right. So just a slightly different technique. You might see that online. Moving on. Uh, so we're going to create another variable called result and we'll set that equal to some evaluation of an expression. Does a equal b? So two uh, equal signs that are next to each other is the equality operator. This is a check for equality to say, does A equal B? And if that is true, then what we'll do is return the word equal as a string. But if it's not true, notice the colon that separates the true from the false, we'll return the word inequal. So, the ternary operator has kind of got several parts here. There's an expression, there's a question mark that, that has true or false ramifications, and we'll just do a console.log um, result, like so. So now let's go ahead and run that, and these are equal. Great. Um, we could also do this in line. So let me just take this part right here and do that instead. 
and you can see how uh, we can basically perform that same check without having to create a new variable to hold the result. All right, so it's a nice inline way of running a quick check and then returning back a string, one string or another string. Now, let me just go back for a second here, or actually, let's do this. And then we'll do console.log result. Okay, let me comment this one out. I wanna keep it around for you in case you wanna reference that in the future. Um, we used two equal signs, but there's another, another type of equality that we can check for, and that's strict equality. And this will check to make sure that these two values are equal, but then in addition to that, it will not coerce, for example, the number one and the string one. Uh, it'll say, are these absolutely equal, at, even with the same data types, all right? And so in this particular case, we should expect a different result. These are unequal, they are not the same. All right, so these are the same because I'm looking for equality, but if I'm looking at strict equality and I'm not allowing JavaScript to coerce the integer into a string and then check for equality, uh, then I have to say, no, these are not the same because one is a number and one's a string, all right? All right, so let me comment that out and let's take do one more check here. Um, in this case, I'm going to use a different operator, the not equal to operator. So I'll just use the word not in equal and not, not equal and not in equal. All right. Which would be the same as saying equal. <laughs> all right. So now let's see and run that. And, uh, this produces a false, so this would be returned back and then displayed on screen. But then we can also do strict inequality by adding another equal sign to that operator. And these are not equal again, because it is true that A is not strictly equal to B because they're different data types. All right, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's go ahead and stop there. Um, and hopefully all of this ternary operator business and, and equality and strict equality makes sense. And let's move on. You're doing great. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks. In this video, we'll talk about iteration statements. Iterations allow us to loop through a body of code, a block of code, a number of times until a certain condition is met. And there's a couple of different types of iteration statements. We'll look at two in this lesson, and we'll even look at them in relationship to arrays, something I promised several lessons ago. So let's start off by creating a new file and call it iterations.js. And inside of here, we'll create our first for loop. So for, and then there are three parts inside of the opening and closing parentheses. First of all, um, we'll let i equals zero, or we can actually just shorthand this and not even use the keyword let. And here i less than 10, i plus plus. And so this is gonna take some explanation, but let's just get this working first and then I'll come back and I'll talk about it. And we'll just print out the value of i, all right? What do you think's gonna happen here? If I didn't tell you anything about how the for loop actually works, what do you think will be printed to screen when we execute our script? Let's find out. So let's go here and type in uh, node iterations. All right, so we get a no, uh, several, it looks like 10 different values printed to screen, each on a separate line, zero through nine, and then our application exits. All right, so let's talk about this. It's a shorthand syntax and there's three parts as separated by these two semicolons inside of this, uh, this evaluation header for the four. First of all, we declare a variable. In this case, I've declared I. That's why we use the let, but then I said, well, we don't really don't need it. Let's keep it short. So we're declaring it and then we're going to um, initialize its value to zero. In the second step, we're gonna say continue running this for loop as long as this condition 
is true. So as long as i is less than 10, continue running the, the body of this for loop as defined with this uh, set of curly braces here. And then finally, after you've run an iteration, increment the value of i by one, all right? And here we're going to then print out the value. And that's why we start at the value of zero. And then we work our way all the way through this 10 times. On the 10th time, i gets incremented to 10. This, this check is performed. It's false. And then we exit out of the program. All right. Now, let's do something a little bit more interesting like I suggested before. Let me comment this out. Here, let's go um, let a equal to, and this should look familiar, 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, and 42. Whoops, I guess I forgot. Equal sign there. And now what we'll do is 4, i equals 0. i is less than a dot length i plus plus. Inside the body of this, we'll do console.log a, and what element? Well, we'll use i, because i will start off with the value of zero, and it will continue until we get to the length property, which is not zero-based. Um, and uh, once we get to, for example, the zero, one, two, three, four, five, so length will be six elements, so once i is 6, it's no longer true that i is less than the length of this array, and we'll exit out. So let's go ahead and save this, and then run. And we can see we get all of our values printed out to screen. So that's the proper way to iterate through, or one way, I should say, to iterate through an array. Now, one thing about Visual Studio Code that I really love is that they have this notion of code snippets. So if you ever forget this, this syntax, and it can be a little daunting at first, uh, there's a way to remember it perfectly every time, and that is to let the code snippets build it for you. So I type in the for keyword, IntelliSense pops up with a little window under it, and I'll use the arrow keys to go to the for loop JavaScript. All right, there's a couple of fours, but the one that we want has this little box with dots underneath of it. That tells me that this is a code snippet. I hit enter on my keyboard, and now I get the basic structure of my um, uh, of my for loop already created for the purpose of an array. Now notice that every word index is highlighted, and I can change that uh, every instance of that by just using a letter. Like I'm going to change this to the letter B instead of index, and notice that it changed it everywhere. And then I'm going to hit the Enter key on my keyboard, which is, was the wrong move. Then I'm going to hit the Tab key on my keyboard, and I can change the name of the array now. Everywhere the word array is used, I can swap that out with the letter A, for example. I'll use the Tab key one more time. Here it puts me to the, another replaceable area for the element, and here I'll use C. I'll use Tab one more time, and then it kind of exits me out of that snippet replacement structure and now I can continue on and type like console.log um, and we'll just print out C, okay? So let's grab A from our previous example and then we get the same results as we got before but this time we didn't have to memorize exactly how to use for the code snippet walked us through and allowed us to replace the names of the various replaceable areas like the name of the counter, the name of the array, and the name of the given element C that we extract out of uh, out of our of our array. Okay. So let's comment that out. That's four. And now let's take a look at the while loop. Um, so We'll talk about the difference between these. It may not be obvious at first, but essentially we'll do this. All right, so take a look at this. 
Knowing what you know about loops, what do you think is going to happen here? Well, we start off with one, and we're going to continue to execute this loop until this condition is false. So the very first time we run it, one is indeed less than 10. So we'll continue to run the body, the block that's associated with our while statement. And we'll print out the value of x and then increment its value by 1. We'll continue to do this until we increment the value of x and it becomes 10, at which point this is no longer true, it becomes false, and then we'll break out and continue on. So let's go ahead and see what value, what, uh, what the value is that we get. So we get 1 through 9, that's expected, and once we hit 10, we break out. Great. All right. So what's the difference between the while statement and this first for loop that we did here at the very top? Well, the difference is that the for loop first of all, has a lot of infrastructure that we have to build, these three pieces. And um, it uses a series of indexes that represent the number of iterations that will move through uh, this block of code. Now, the while statement is a little bit different. Anything can be used to drive the iterations. As long as this statement continues to be true, we'll continue to execute this block of code. Uh, and so we control the number of iterations in the body, in this case, here I do the x++. plus plus. Now we don't have to use counters, we could use anything, any kind of business logic, like we may want to read to the end of a file and once we hit the end of the file, it no longer, it makes sense to continue to read each line of the file, then we would want to break out. So the while is a little bit more flexible in so much that we can build the business logic for how many times we're gonna iterate in the body of the, uh, the while statement. Whereas with the four, we're pretty much limited to the number of times we want to run this being the number of times that we've kind of preset it up here in this top section outside of the body itself. Okay. Now there's also one last thing we can talk about, and that's a way in both the for and the while we can kind of circumvent this check right here. And we may want to do a check like this. So if X is equal to seven, then we'll call the break statement. All right, so learning what we've learned about the if statement, it probably should look more like that, all right? So let's first of all, let's make sure it works. All right, in this case, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Once we reach the seven, we circumvent this check and just say, hey, I wanna break out of this, all right? So we can use that always to break out, just like we broke out of the switch uh, when we wanted to not let it flow through additional cases. Now, the one thing I will say, if you notice how I typed this to begin with, let's retype that. So hold on, let me comment this out so that you can see it in the code if you wanna download my code. But we could also do it a little bit more shorter and in line since I only have one statement that I wanna make right after the if statement, I can do it on the same line and I don't need to surround it with a code block. A code block indicates that there's usually more than one line of code. In this case, there's just one line of code. Uh, I could put it on the separate line and use some indentation like that, or I can just keep it all on the same line since it's so short. But that might improve readability, or I might decide that this is a more readable form. That's kind of up to me, and if I'm working on a, with a team of software developers, I might wanna get and kind of do it the way that they do it. But stylistic for me, this is so short, I can read it all in one shot. If X is seven, then break out of it. It just, it looks good. It's very readable. I'll be able to understand what I'm doing later on. It doesn't take up and move the code down. So I like that, that format. If I just need to create one statement right after my if, uh, right after my if. So sometimes it makes sense to split things on separate lines. Sometimes it makes sense to keep two different statements on the same line. Uh, again, I think it kind of is a, a stylistic choice that you'll, you'll have to make for yourself at some point. All right, so that is iteration statements. We looked at two different kinds and we looked at how code snippets can be used to help us remember the format. Now, I believe the while has, in fact, I believe most of the things that we've looked at has um, uh, some, uh, some code snippets available to them like if I find it here in IntelliSense, I hit enter on the keyboard, but there's not as much to it there. I mean, while with the condition, I can change this to X 
is less than 10, right? Um, it's not so much for me to type that out, but the four makes a little bit more sense because there's so many parts to it and replaceable parts of that. Okay, so let's continue on in the next video. We'll see you there. Thanks. It seems like quite a while ago we talked about variables, but now that uh, we're working with blocks of code inside of blocks of code like we had here in lines number 23 and then 29 through 31, uh, we need to talk about variable scope. And when I use the term scope, I mean variables are a little bit like people in so much that variables have a lifespan. They're born, they do work, and then they die, and they're removed from computer's memory when they go out of scope. And we'll see an example of, of that in just a moment. But they're also like people in so much that they have a citizenship, I guess you can say. In other words, depending on where they were born, they can work inside of some code blocks, but not other code blocks. And so the remainder of this video, we're gonna look at lifetime, and availability or citizenship, I guess you can say, inside of the rest of your application. So let me create a new file and we're gonna call this Scope Basics. And there will be more to say about scope as we move forward and learn more about functions and so on in just a little while here. But let's start and uh, create first example here. So let a equals first. Then I'm going to create a function called scope test. And inside of here, I'll just do a console.log. And the first thing I want to see is if I declare a variable out here, outside of my function, can I reference it inside of my function? And so to find out, let's just call scope test and see what we get. So here we're going to type node scope basics and we can in fact view the value of a variable that was declared outside of the scope of a function we can view it inside of the scope of that function all right so the next thing that I want to do is to say hey um, let's create a variable here Now, if I create a variable inside of a function scope, can I view it out here, outside of the function scope? So console.log b. And let's see. And so no, not only can I not see it, but my application actually blows up. And you can see the little caret here is right underneath the B and it says B is not defined. So in other words, you can kind of think of it again in terms of the lifespan. We created a function and we created a variable inside of that function. That variable lives as long as that function is running, but after the function, after that code block is has completed executing, then B is removed from the computer's memory and essentially thrown away. Therefore, we cannot reference that variable outside of the function because it no longer lives, it's dead, all right? So we're gonna have to comment that out and we can go ahead and comment this out as well. Now, let's do one more thing here. Let's say if A, and we'll just do something silly here. If it's not equal to an empty string, so just two single quote marks next to each other, so uh, then can we still see the value of A even inside this innermost block of code that we defined with an if statement? If we can, we should see then it printed here a second time, the value first. Um, so let's save what we have. Let's run this again. And so we see first, first. The first time it's printed out and the second time that is printed out. All right, so yes, if something is declared in an outside scope, it is visible or it can, it has citizenship in every inner scope from that point on. But here, once again, if we were to create a variable third and then try to reference it outside of the code block in which it was defined, like so, will this work? What do you think? We're gonna get that same kind of error before we get the little 
arrow pointing to the C and it says that C is not defined. The variable C was defined inside of this code block and once we uh, executed that code block and got to the end of it, then uh, it C was removed from the computer's memory. It's no longer available to us. In a sense, dies and it's no longer available. Okay. Now let's just do one last thing here, just to to kind of understand that we are in fact able to work with uh, the variable that was defined in the outermost scope. Can we still work with it, do it, uh, use it, and change its value? So I'm going to change this to changed. And then I'm going to reference it here, console.log A. And so now let's run our application one more time. All right. So the first time that it's run, this first console.log, it will be the value first. But then we change the value and we log it again and that's where the second change comes from after we've executed that function then we execute line 20 and that's where this third changed appears all right so i guess the moral of the story once again to kind of reiterate what we said when you declare a variable you have to understand in which scope it was defined because based on the scope or rather the code block in which that variable is defined it's going to have a lifespan and it's going to have citizenship. If it was defined in the outermost scope, it will have its life and its citizenship in all inner scopes. But if it's defined in an innermost scope, it will not be available to outer scopes. Now, one last thing, and I'll kind of end it right here. If we were to take, and this is probably just a question for you, just thought question. If I define B here, right above that if statement and then I attempt to use it right here and call this inside if do you think that will be able to reference that value well based on what we know about the rules I would expect to see the value second uh, printed out so let's try it and in fact we do see it so hopefully that supports your new understanding of the scope of variables, defining them outside of a code block versus defining them inside of a code block and trying to reference them outside, okay? So hopefully that all makes sense. We wanna make sure you're clear on that. We're gonna revisit the topic of scope because there's a lot more to this, but this is your first introduction so that you kind of understand what the rules of scope are, at least in the most basic sense. All right, so we'll continue on the next video. See you there, thanks. Scope is a topic that we'll keep coming back to over and over throughout this course. It's important because at least when your JavaScript is run inside of a web browser, you must be aware of the topmost level of scope, which is referred to as global scope. In Node, like we're using here, it's not as much of an issue. They've got some safeguards against it, but in web development, working against the global scope is a crucial concern. A lot of consternation and consequently a lot of effort has been exerted to preach that declaring variables at the global scope is a bad idea. So you would never want to do something, let me create a new file here, returning functions.js, js, there we go. <clears throat> you never want to do something like this, note the use of the var keyword. And you never want to do something like this. Although you're more likely to do it than the previous line in line number one. Now, the reasons why you would never want to do that, this will require a little bit more explanation a little bit down the road. And I'll make this point emphatically when we start writing JavaScript for the web browser uh, later on in this course, but for now, just understand that much of what I'll say and why I say it over the course of the next 
five or six lessons or so, we'll be working towards a solution to avoid writing your code in the global scope if at all possible. Now the eventual solution that I want to demonstrate relies on how JavaScript functions work, but we need to take a few baby steps to get there. So the first aspect of this technique that I want to demonstrate has to do with returning a function from a function. Now up until now, our functions performed one or more actions and then exited quietly. We may have returned a simple value like uh, true or high or something along those lines. However, we can create functions that can not only perform some action, but then at the very end can return a value to the caller and not just any value can return a function. So let me comment all this stuff out and I'll say don't do this <laughs> to make sure you never do that and this either and then I'll just uh, do a multi-line comment here and so let's start off really simple this is something that we've already talked about when we talked about uh, declaring functions or function declarations so here's function one and inside of function one we can just return the string one right it's not very exciting but it demonstrates the point that you can use the return keyword to return a value to whichever calls that so for example let value equals one for example and what would we expect to be in our variable value well we would expect to print out the string o n e or one so console dot log and value like so and just to see this working let's go ahead say node and then returning functions and we see it returns here at the bottom of our screen the string one as we'd hoped now we could also kind of paraphrase this make this a little simpler by just doing it all in one line right so we could put the call to the function and not use a variable we could just make the call to the function, which returns a string, and that returned value will automatically be passed into the console.log method. Let's save that. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's a common technique that we'll want to use. But things start to get a little bit more mind-bending when you start to think of a function as just another data type in JavaScript. So, for example, um, let's go back to this. I'm going to copy this again. And then let's go um, console.log and then type of value, all right? And, um, well, let's do this. Let's get rid of the method invocation operator. So now we're just setting a reference called value to our function one. Let's see what we get. And you can see the type is function. So let's think about all the data types we know about now. We know about string. We know about number. We know about Boolean. We know about uh, undefined. And we know about function, right? And we're going to learn a couple more before this is all said and done. But at any rate, notice here again, I'm just, in fact, we could even do this a little bit differently. I may have muddied the waters by introducing a variable. Let's just do that instead. And we should get the same the same result. All right. So uh, I guess the heart of the matter here is that we can get a reference to a function, and we can store that reference to the function out in uh, in a variable. Which means we could also do something like this. So now we have a reference to the function. We can call the function using the method invocation or the function invocation operator. So Let's go ahead and run it. Whoops. I guess we need to actually then go console.log. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. There we go. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. I just have a variable pointed to the function. And then now that I have a variable pointed to the function, I can execute the function by just using that variable with our method invocation operator, right? All right, hopefully you're still with me so far. Hopefully this isn't too mind bending. Let's continue on here. So since a function is just 
a data type like any other data type that we've learned about so far, our functions could return a function because we're just returning uh, a value, right? And that value can be any type. So in other words, let's, let's do this. Uh, function two. And here we're going to do return a function. Now this is a function expression inside of a function declaration, right? And here console.log and two, like so. And then um, do something like uh, let my function equal two. Now what gets returned to my function? It'll be this enter function expression. So I should be able to do something like uh, my function with the method invocation operators. And let's see what we get. And we get the value two like we'd hoped, all right? So hopefully you can see here, we're using the return keyword to return a function expression. We get a reference to that function expression by calling the outer function declaration. Now we have a function in hand or reference to that function, this inner function right here, and we merely invoke it. Hopefully all that makes sense. Um, and we might be able to do this a little bit differently. Let's try just a slightly different tact. So here I'm going to go uh, function three, and here I'm going to return um, function, and then um, return three. All right. Oops, let me spell return correctly. All right. So in this case, I'm returning a function that returns a string. So I should be able to do something like. Um, console.log, and then I'm going to call three. What do I get back from that? I should get back a function. So I should be able to invoke that function to get back the string to give to the console.log. Now you would never do this and you would never see this, but this is just to illustrate a point that um, of what you're really working with and that's references. Whoops, let's actually execute it. There we go, three. What you're, you're working with here are references to functions that can return references to other things and maybe even other functions, right? So again, that last one's pretty far-fetched. You probably never do that. But the fact is that what gets returned from our three function declaration is a function, and then it can be invoked with the function invocation operator here, the second set of inner parentheses right there, all right? So on the surface, this might not seem like a very significant development in our JavaScript journey, but nothing actually could be further from the truth because this is actually a huge step towards moving our code out of the global namespace like I talked about at the beginning of this video. But to complete the story, again, we have several more baby steps to go. We're gonna need to step away from functions for a little bit and come back to them once we've learned a little bit more about arrays and objects and objects specifically. All right, so just keep this thought in mind and we'll continue on. You're doing great, hang in there. We'll see you in the next video, thanks. If you remember, uh, when we were looking at arrays, I did the type of on an array and it returned back the word object. So that's actually another data type in JavaScript that we haven't looked at until now. Obviously, given the title of this lesson, we're going to look at objects. So an object is similar to an array in some ways, but its intent is dramatically different. An array will hold a list of information. In other words, there may be many data items whether they're strings or numbers or booleans or even objects, each stored in a different element of the array. Uh, contrast that to how an object works. An object contains the related properties of a single data element. So array, many data elements. An object, one data element but has attributes. So the settings of the properties define the characteristics of the object. So let's say, for example, that you want to have a car. And so an array will only really let you save maybe 
the year of the car or the make of the car or the model of the car as a string or maybe some identifying number, but an object would allow us to define all of those properties kind of in the same container. So, you know, if you try to keep track of all the properties and maybe even all the methods that, uh, that uh, belong to a car, but you keep them as separate variables and separate functions, you'd run the risk of clashing with other variables and functions that have the same name for a different car, okay? But objects let us keep that information kind of safely locked away in their own little container where the relationship between all those properties and functions uh, are obvious, that they all kind of belong together to describe one car. Uh, and then you might have another object that describes a different car. And you can keep both of those objects, those two cars, in an array of cars. So hopefully you can see the relationship between those. All right. So um, let me first of all start out by creating a new file, object.js. And so, um, you know, I may have an object that has a series of properties that describe a specific car and I might want to, for example, keep track of the make, the model, and the year, and so on. And I may have some functions that I need as well, things like uh, getting the price of the car uh, based on some criteria, maybe, you know, the year of the car and things of that nature. Uh, and I may want to print out a special description of the car that includes many things like the make, the model, the year in a special format. But I might define a car object like so. So let's do... Um, uh, let car equals, and then we define an object using a um, a code block, so curly braces. Now I'm going to use kind of a name value pair here, so let me just go ahead and start typing. All right, take a second and catch up with me there, if you like. Now let's go ahead and use the print description function, like so. And let's use the year property, like so. I'm gonna save my work and then I'm gonna type in node object or object. And uh, the first printout is BMW 745LI because we're printing out the make and the model of this car. All right. And then here I'm just getting the year of the car and printing that out in a console window. All right. So in this case, this object that I've built on screen, uh, we're dealing with a tangible, real world and very relatable concept. Uh, that of a car. We've all driven in cars or have driven cars, uh, in your JavaScript code, you'll occasionally be working with objects that define tangible real world things like cars, but you're also going to work with things that represent more abstract concepts that are specific to web client or web server development. So in this sample, I created an object using what's called object literal syntax. So I literally want to create this object and then I'm going to assign that object to a variable named car. Uh, and the body of the object is, like I pointed out, defined with cur a series of curly braces. Here, this set of curly braces at the outermost level here, this defines kind of the boundaries for the object and everything that lives inside of it is either a property of that object or a function called a method inside of that, inside of that object. So, Let's start off in lines three, four, and five. Here we have a list of name 
value pair. So here's the name of the property, and here's the value of the property. In this case, notice that each of the names of the properties are just um, identifiers. They're just like variables. In fact, you'll probably want to use the same naming conventions that you would use inside of with a variable. And then the values can be any data type. In this case, I have a literal string BMW, a literal string 745LI, and a literal number 2010 that represents the year. All right. And notice that the property and the value are separated by the colon character. All right. And then each property definition, as well as each function, uh, up until the last one, are separated by commas. Now, I put each of these properties and functions on their own line or series of lines, as it might be for the functions, in order so that we could see some readability, but that's not entirely necessary from JavaScript's perspective. It would be fine if we put all this on one line of code. All right. So, uh, again, with regards to the names of both properties and these functions, which I call methods, you'll want to use the same naming conventions uh, that we used previously when we talked about variables. Now, there's some other ways to create objects, and I'll discuss another technique in one of the upcoming lessons. Um, so uh, we'll come back to that notion because it, it'll lead into another discussion that kind of takes us off at a whole other tangent that I want, don't want to go on right now. So um, here we define the function, kind of the same notion. I gave it an identifier, the name of the function that I want to access. And then I'm using a function expression and define the function expression within uh, several lines here, but essentially we're just returning a value or in the case of the second one, just just calling console.log. We could write any uh, number of, of lines of code inside of here. These are just happen to be very simple for the purpose of illustration. All right, so I've defined my object. Now I want to actually use it and reference it. How do I do that? Well, you can see that whenever I wanted to access a specific property of my object or when I wanted to access a function, I use the variable name that I set the object reference to, and then I use the period on the keyboard, the, which I call the um, uh, the property access operator, just the dot on the keyboard. Uh, same is true when access of, accessing a function. Uh, as you can see here in line number 15, I use that period, that member uh, access operator. And then you know, all else is fair. This is a function, so I'm going to use the method invocation operator just like I would to invoke a normal function. Now, uh, I, I keep referring to these functions that are inside of a uh, an object as a method, and, and I think you should probably start referring to functions defined inside of objects as methods. Uh, it's a more descriptive term, and I'm already used to it from my work with other programming languages, but simply put, a method is a function that belongs to, or rather is defined inside of, an object. Now, there's another syntax that I could use in addition to what you see here, um, and it, it opens up some interesting possibilities that, frankly, I'm not very fond of. <laughs> uh, but you could definitely do something like this, so it, it almost looks like I'm using the array uh, array element accessor to access a specific property here. Let me go ahead and save that so we'll see the year appear twice here if all goes well and we do at the bottom. So that's one approach to accessing an individual um, property. And uh, the other is similar uh, but it uses a um, an index so it's actually kind of interesting how this works um, what is the the fur or index one of my car let's find out the hard way here and it's set to undefined in this case so actually it doesn't reference any of these it basically creates its own new property and sets its value to undefined let's never do that Let's not do that. I prefer the dot syntax. Again, it's going to be most familiar to those of us coming from other programming languages. Um, but you could, in some advanced scenarios, use these techniques to do something a little more advanced. And that's way beyond the scope of this, of this lesson. All right. So I'd recommend you just use that dot notation for now, and all will be happy. So um, 
you can do, like I kind of mentioned a second ago, some pretty advanced things with objects, and there's a lot of room for variation. So I'd recommend uh, taking a look and taking notice of how other people work with objects in their JavaScript code as you're perusing the internet, um, because there's always seems to be a new twist. I think I understand how objects work, and then I'll see somebody do something really extreme and interesting, and I'm like, wow, that, that opens up my understanding a little bit more to how objects work. Um, I'll just give you a quick example of what I'm talking about here. Um, here we can create a another car, and I can create an empty object like so. And then I don't have any properties inside of my another car. How do I reference another uh, properties of uh, uh, inside of that? Well, what I can do is just um, kind of just say, hey, I want to create a property here called whatever. And I'll set it equal to Bob. <laughs> All right, and it'll just automatically create a property called whatever and set its value equal to Bob, just like that. No let or var keyword or anything. If I do console.log, um, you'll see that car dot whatever, in fact, will come out to be Bob. Or I thought it would. Oh, I think what I'm going to need to do is save my work here and then do try this again. Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry another car. I had the wrong reference. It didn't exist on car, but we need to look at another car dot whatever. And there we go. There's Bob. Okay. So just an interesting feature of objects. Uh, you can, you can add properties kind of ad hoc. Uh, and some people do that. And that is kind of a feature, not really a bug of JavaScript, it's dynamically typed. You can just say, hey, I need a property here, I need a function here, and you attach it to an existing object, and there it is. It's You've got an object now with this additional property called whatever, all right? Um, you can also do some other kind of interesting things. Might as well take a few moments and look at these. So um, I'm, I'm feeling unoriginal now. So I'm gonna create a new object called A, and inside of this, I'm gonna create uh, my property, and I'm gonna actually set that to another object. I'll define a property inside of that, and I'll just say, hi, because again, I'm feeling rather unoriginal. Um, and so let's figure out how can we actually print out the A, uh, so console.log a.myproperty.b. Will I get what I think I'll get? I will. So you can see how I can chain things together, whether they be functions or properties, by just continuing to use, you know, this is an object that has a property that has an object that has a property. <laughs> and so I can kind of chain through and, and create essentially what becomes a namespace. And we'll, we'll reference that a little bit later when we talk about solving the global namespace issue or, or putting our variables at the at the global level uh, of our of our applications, which we're trying to avoid. All right, um, let's take a look at another quick, cool example of things you can do with objects that might not be so obvious at first glance. So uh, here I'll create var c, and inside of that I'm going to create another my property, and this time I want to create an array. So this property the value of my property now will be an array of, I could do strings, I could do numbers, but I could do an array of objects. So, And that's perfectly valid. So here, think with me again. I have an object that has a property that contains an array of objects that each have different properties. All right, and that's perfectly valid. So objects can contain properties of the type array that can contain other objects that can contain, well, 
really just whatever makes sense for your application, however you need to store it and kind of represent the data that you're working with. Also, if you're going to work with an array of objects, it might make sense for all of them to have the same set of properties. Like in this case, each object has a different property. I'm not so sure that would be so useful, but it might be something that uh, you need to model in your application. There's nothing forcing you to keep the same set of properties for any given object uh, inside of an array of that, of that object. Uh, you know, as long as your JavaScript code or whatever will consume this, this object understands how to interpret it, that's all that matters. So once you get past the simple hierarchy of values, you typically refer to something like this that gets a little more complicated as an object graph, a graph of objects. All right, just keep that in mind. Let me paste in some more interesting examples here. Uh, just kind of get expand your thought process on how to work with objects. Let's say I have a car lot and I want to um, store an array of objects. Each object has year, make, and model. All right. Then I could iterate through the car lot and print to screen each of those individual car objects, right? So that's one example. How about, um, you know, if this was more of a, of a I guess you could say, uh, a system that kept track of all of our customers and employees, we might do something like this. This gets a little more complicated and unfortunately runs off the side of the screen a little bit. But you can see here I'm creating a contacts object. Uh, here's the start and the end. And inside of that I have a property called customers and a property called employees. Now both of these have, as you can see, an array of objects. And these objects look very similar in so much that they have a first name, last name, and then phone numbers. And then phone numbers actually is an array of strings. In this case, this particular, what is he, a customer? This customer, Bob Tabor, has two phone numbers. Richard Boughton has two phone numbers. And then, but our employees like Steve and Conrad and Grant, um, well, Steve has two phone numbers, but Connor and Grant only have one phone number. All right, so you can see that things can get pretty crazy really quick. But that's a perfectly valid um, object initializer. It just happens to be a little bit more complex than the ones that we started off with. So now as you're looking at this, you might think to yourself, wow, this, this actually looks similar. Where have I seen this before? It looks a lot like JSON. Have you heard of JSON, J-S-O-N, or JSON? I guess some people put the emphasis on the on. <laughs> it's short for JavaScript Object Notation. JSON is both descriptive and compact, and it's probably the most popular way to send information between two disparate systems. So we might, in fact, use it uh, to store um, settings or properties inside of a... Um, you know, uh, a more advanced JavaScript application, or they use it in Visual Studio and C-sharp projects to store application settings, for example, uh, now in, in the new version of C-sharp and, and .NET. Um, we might use it in our application sooner than later to send data between a single page application that lives on the client and the backing uh, web API that uh, on a web server that hosts a web API. If none of that made sense, don't worry about it. Eventually you'll get to that point if you continue on learning JavaScript. All right, so uh, what was my point here? Well, if you're familiar with what JSON is, you might notice that there are a lot of similarities between the object literals that we've looked at in this video and JSON. However, there are some subtle but important differences between the two, and I'm not going to take the time to go through that. You can easily do a quick search online to see what the differences are between object literals in JavaScript and the JavaScript object notation, or JSON. Just be aware that these are not one in the same. There are subtle differences. You cannot use them interchangeably, but their syntax is very, very similar. And JSON, uh, or I'm sorry, JavaScript has a built-in um, function that will let you work with JSON as you might expect. Okay. Wow, I've really gone long on this one, but objects are pretty important and we're going to use them a lot and uh, there's a lot to them. In fact, we're probably going to be talking about them a couple more times before the end of this course, maybe even in the very next video. Uh, so uh, you're doing great. Hang in there. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Previously, I said that much effort and education is centered around the dangers of defining variables and functions in the global scope, also referred to as the global namespace. 
uh, especially when writing JavaScript that will ultimately be targeted at running in a web browser. But I never really answered the question, why is it dangerous? I never kind of ventured into that. And I'm going to illustrate more clearly later on why this is dangerous and how you can uh, really hurt yourself when you are uh, creating variables and functions in the global scope. But in a nutshell, the global scope is global. So number one, each variable that you define to the global scope is not removed from the computer's memory until the web browser or the tab of the web browser navigates to a new web page. So um, the more that you add into that global scope, the more memory you're taking up and that memory just is, is consumed the entire time that that tab is open uh, for that particular web page. But more importantly, number two, um, again, emphasizing that this is the case with JavaScript in the web browser, not so much true whenever you're building these node style applications. As you load JavaScript that you wrote and you rely on JavaScript code that others write, whether that be uh, code that uh, JavaScript libraries that you've downloaded from the internet or that you include in your project somehow, maybe they're ones that other people in your company have written and you need to include them in your project, or perhaps even sold commercially online, some product that you purchased came with a JavaScript file and you include it. Maybe it hasn't been updated in a number of years. The variables and the functions that are defined in those files, when you consider the, uh, the, the variables and the functions that you've written in your files, there's a, the more that you write at the global scope, the more that they wrote at the global scope, if they didn't take precaution, the more likely you're going to have a collision of names. At some point, somewhere down the road, somebody's going to have a variable named what you named, and they're both trying to contend for uh, the global, for being the variable, the, the winner in the global scope. So you call these naming collisions. Uh, and when these naming collisions happen, either your data will get overwritten by their code or their data will be overwritten by your code. Uh, but either way, undoubtedly, it'll cause unanticipated uh, bugs that are difficult to track down and quite frustrating. And the reason why this is even a thing is because it's happened. <laughs> okay, so now that it's happened, everybody is extremely concerned about it. And so a series of suggestions came out and, and a lot of effort went, again, around trying to figure out how to solve this issue, given the, the tools in JavaScript that they had available. Um, and the first one that has come out and that I've recommended from the very first lines of code that we've written is to use the let keyword and start of the, instead of the var keyword, because the var keyword will attach variables to the global scope which in a web browser is the window object in the document object model. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and uh, I, it's also recommended that you use the technique, the design pattern that we're going to discuss in this video whenever you're writing JavaScript code. Or there's a third option too, which is new in JavaScript in the latest version of JavaScript called modules. Unfortunately, and I may even talk about this at more length later on, the implementation of modules is a little bit uneven between Node and the web browsing environment. So uh, I'm not sure how helpful that would be, at, at least as we're getting started and learning about JavaScript. Just keep in mind that there's several different attacks, but this is probably the one that you'll see used most often in um, at least uh, JavaScript that's been written over the course of the last five to 10 years. But there are some newer ways to, to tackle this. All right, so at any rate, the technique that I'm gonna discuss in this video uh, or the design pattern actually uses a couple of techniques that we've learned about so far. We're gonna use an iffy, remember what that is? An immediately invoked function expression. Uh, to create a function, and then that function will return an object, and that object will have defined functions and variables that uh, will then be kind of scoped to one variable. So instead of having five or ten variables, we'll have only one variable in the global scope, uh, or at least in some scope, and then we'll be able to reference the individual 
uh, variables and property uh, variables and, and functions of that particular object that gets returned. All right, so we'll see how variables and functions can be made essentially private so that we can hide some implementations from uh, the ability for just any code to call them. Uh, this is often called encapsulation in software development terms. And so these will be unavailable outside of the public variables and the public functions that we return, and that's generally a good thing. So there will be a couple of benefits that come out of this. All right, so um, let's get started by creating a new uh, a new file called uh, modulepattern.js. All right, so let's start by creating an iffy. And to do that, hopefully you remember how to do that. We're going to start with a function expression. We'll just create an empty one to start off with. We wrap it in a set of parentheses, and then we use another set of parentheses to actually invoke it. All right. So what I'm going to do before we get any further is actually set this immediately invoked function expression to a variable. I'm going to call this counter. So I'll set counter equal to whatever is returned. So um, eventually what we're going to do here is return an object full of properties, properties that have values, properties that point to functions that can be called. But we can also do some private stuff here. And this will not be accessible outside of the calling the counter dot something to access it. And so we can like have a private variable here, like let count equals zero. And we would not be able to do counter.count. .count. It just wouldn't be accessible. We'll fix that here in a moment when we return an object. We'll give an accessor to it. We'll take a couple of passes at that, actually. OK. So um, let's go and create now a private function as well. And this will just print out a message and style it up a little bit differently. So we'll, we won't get crazy here. So console.log. And um, we'll just uh, say um, whatever the message is. And then we'll just do like three dashes like that. Just a little bit of style, just to show that you know we have something here that could be private. But now, ultimately, what we want to do is return an object that will get set to counter here. All right, so. Um, we're going to start off simple. We'll come back to this a little bit later because there's going to be an issue with one part of this, actually this part right here. What if I just want to return back the counter, the current value, of, or rather the current value of count? I can try that. Again, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but let's say we create like an increment, uh, increment property, and it will return a function. And inside that function, we can do something like count plus equal to one. And uh, then we can call the, our print method and then just say after increment, something like that. We can also, and here let me use a comma right there because we're going to create another property of our return object called uh, reset. And what this will do is call a function. So we'll create another function expression, print before reset. Then we'll call the count and then print, or we'll set count equal to zero because that's the point of a reset. And then after reset, it should always display zero, but let's just double check that, all right? So now we have basically our, uh, our module pattern. We created a module, which is essentially an iffy that returns an object that will expose functions and other properties like um, like the current count. And now here, because I've invoked this immediately, this is available. It's already been executed and counter now is fully populated and ready to be used in our application. So I can do counter dot um, value, I think. Wasn't that the name of it? I've forgotten everything already. Okay, yeah, value. So console dot log counter dot value. And um, I could try to do console.log counter.count just to prove that it won't give me anything back. So let's just start there and we'll go uh, node module pattern 
And uh, first time we get an undefined wide because count is not a property of counter uh, because we didn't, ex it's not exposed and it's not being returned in the return object. All right, so that is impossible. Now what we can do, however, or we will try to do is call counter, whoops, counter dot increment. You can see it shows up in IntelliSense. That's a good sign. Uh, so we'll call increment. In fact, let's call it like three times. Whoops. Kind of ended up below where I wanted to go there. All right, great. And then we'll call counter dot reset like so. All right, so let's see what we get this time. It's not going to quite be as satisfying uh, because we're going to get a little issue on on uh, on these lines here. So you can see after the increment, the value is one, two, and three. But then when we attempt to get the value of counter from this property, count, it, we would assume it would be three, right? But it's zero. What happened here? Well, we accidentally created something called a closure and another little topic we need to talk about in JavaScript. So let's not do that. We're going to need a different way to implement this basic functionality. So can't use this technique. What we're going to need to do is take a different tact and we're going to implement two more functions. Here we'll create a set function or I'm sorry, let's start with a get function and get we'll do something super simple it's just going to return count and then and I did it all in one line could have done it on multiple lines didn't need to it's pretty simple function and here we're going to set count equal to some value that's going to be passed in so here we'll say we'll accept an input parameter called value making sure we add some commas in between these new properties here that are set to these functions. We'll take in some value and we'll set count equal to that. So we should be able to come down here. And now since we've kind of removed that, let's go um, uh, counter dot uh, get, or actually let's set it to the value of seven. Here we'll do a console dot log counter dot get to ensure that it is seven and then we'll call our reset let's see what we get when we run it this time all right this is a little bit more interesting well almost interesting i need to invoke get okay so i have, i forgot that save it run it one more time there we go okay so here we go lines 33 through 35 will produce these three lines where we're after increment one two and three then we call counter set passing in the value seven. And so we then do console.log get counter get and we get that seven back out. Now we call reset and before the reset, the value will be seven after the reset, we reset it to zero. Okay. So hopefully you can see that this technique of returning an object from an iffy will, first of all, allow us to keep some implementation deals, uh, uh, details private, like we couldn't get to count and we didn't try, but we wouldn't be able to get to print because only certain things are being returned. Um, and mostly in, in terms of, of functions uh, that give us access to the private functionality and, and a little bit more. But in addition to that, we've reduced, think of all these variables that we've reduced out of the global um, out of the global scope. There's no count variable now. There's no print. There's no get, set, increment, or reset. They're all part of this one variable called counter. And so there's less of a chance that we're, our namespaces are going to collide as a result of that. Now we want to pick something unique there, maybe something that describes a little bit better uh, what the intent of this is. Um, maybe something specific to our brand or company and, and maybe pick something fairly unique there. But uh, as a result of that, we've protected ourselves and written our code a little bit more defensively. Now, there's one more thing that I want to talk about here, and that is that, uh, okay, so keep in mind, this 
This technique that I've just demonstrated here is so popular that it has a name. This is the module pattern. There's another variation that was created on this called the revealing module pattern. You might see this used as well. Let's go ahead and create another file. And um, I'm going to call this reveal, revealing module.js. All right, and I'm just going to paste some code in so that we can kind of compare and contrast the two versions. All right, so it's it's near very similar in so much that we have an iffy that we've defined. Inside of that iffy, we have some private stuff just like we had before. Here we have some more private stuff. These are the implementations of get, set, increment, and reset. But I've created these as uh, function declarations with names. Now here at the bottom, we have, this is the revealing part of the revealing module pattern. Here I'm revealing publicly accessible uh, functions by including them as properties in this return object. So I can call counter.get and counter.set exactly the way that I could before, but behind the scenes they're calling the implementations that are defined here. And so there's a couple of benefits and a couple of downsides. First of all, it what makes it a revealing module pattern is that it reveals the public functions through these properties in the return object, okay? And it's a, cle a cleaner, clearer presentation of what actually gets returned. But there is a downside, and that is you can accidentally overwrite. These are just properties, so I could set the value to, to get equal seven and, not, and forget the method invocation operator. And uh, as a result, I can pretty much just break the association between get and the function name get count and so that's a downside. We could accidentally break this. Whereas in our module pattern, um, you, you can't really do it. That's not possible. Okay. So um, that's the module pattern, the revealing module pattern. It brings together a bunch of techniques we've learned, all to the greater good of removing or reducing, rather, our impact on the global namespace by removing variable names and function names from our uh, from the global scope okay and we'll see why that's important on the web development side of things as we move in that direction but wanted to kind of bring all that to a head all right so let's uh, continue on in the next video we'll see you there thanks As you're getting started, closures can be another mind-bending topic in JavaScript, but they don't have to be. If you understand them, you can really unlock the power of JavaScript. Now, having said that, uh, personally, I don't rely on them very often when I write code, but I'm not a JavaScript ninja, so uh, your mileage may vary. You're going to see a lot of articles and tutorials out there that talk about closures, and I think sometimes they make things more difficult than they really need to. Uh, so I hope to provide a really simple uh, explanation that will simplify this topic for you and you can get into some of the more advanced stuff a little bit later on but basically a closure allows you to associate some data with a function and uh, then use the function with that data already kind of baked into it from that point on in my mind it's kind of like this I'm basically taking a function and I'm marrying it to some data through an input parameter an input argument and then they live happily ever after in their own variable. And from that point on, they work together as a team whenever I want to invoke that function with that data already pre-filled, I guess you could say, into the input parameters, I can call that new variable. All right, that's all it is. Um, and then, well, okay, there's more to it than that. But for the most part, that's all there is. So let's just create a really simple example or two and, and hopefully it'll clear some things up. So uh, let's uh, create a new file called closures.js. And uh, let's start with just a function. I'm going to create something super simple. Say hello. And then inside of here, I'm going to return a function, because that's kind of the point of this. And um, 
it'll just uh, say howdy and um, I guess we're gonna pass in a name so howdy plus the name all right all right so that's really step one I create a function that returns a function looks like I got a little problem here whoops I return a function there we go uh, so here's the function returns a function and I'm passing in a argument called name that I'll ultimately use in the body of this return function all right so then I can actually uh, make a call so uh, for example let Bob equal say hello and passing in Bob now from this point on um, I call Bob well, we'll see what happens here. Node closures. All right, howdy, Bob. All right. So um, by itself, it isn't all that impressive, but that's really kind of step two and three all in one shot. So I can pass in some variable that slightly modifies the way that this return function operates. So in this case, it's pretty simple. I'm passing in a name, and it will change what gets printed out every time whenever you call this function in the console uh, dot log. All right. So this value is basically um, saved off in a variable outside of the returned function. So we're relying relying on how scoping works in order to get that closure behavior that name kind of follows along this return function everywhere it goes. Bob gets passed along from that point on and then this is step three where I save that off in its own variable so that I can call from that point on and I kind of get this say hello with Bob pre-filled. Right? So I can do the same thing with um, Conrad say hello and then Grant say hello and that's all a closure really is. So let's do those. And there you go. Three versions of the same function that get returned. We modify the operation by taking advantage of how scoping works in JavaScript by kind of giving it this value that it's going to hold in its own in its own um, context from that point on uh, in stored in the, these separate variables. All right. So this is really uh, just the binding process uh, that binds these together and then stores them off. And that's all it really is. So another way to look at this, the say hello method uh, has finished executing and it returns a function. Uh, but in the environment in which the method originally ran it preserved that so that whatever value we passed in is preserved inside of this return function uh, the environment or in this case just the name input parameter this variable name uh, remains available so now in step four I guess you could say if there was a step four I basically use the new variable which represents a call to the method and a preset input parameter to conveniently call that version of my function now All right. so um, the important lesson to take away is that each closer closure creates its own what's called lexical environment and you'll see the term lexical used a lot in JavaScript uh, whenever you're learning about scope I try to steer away from that term because I feel like maybe it clouds the issue a little bit it's basically just a fancy word for everything that we learned about in the scope basics here uh, previously where if you define a variable outside of a function it is available inside the function but if you define it in a child code block essentially it's not available outside of that child code block so that's basically what I mean by lexical scope it basically defines how a parser resolves variable names and functions when they're nested um, and the word lexical refers to the fact that lexical scoping uses the location where a variable is declared within the source code to determine where that variable is available from that point on throughout the rest of your code. So nested functions like we have um, here in our say hello that returns a function um, have access to the variables that are declared here outside of it as well as any of the input parameters uh, that are declared outside of it. 
and uh, outside of their original scope, right? And that's just how the lexical rules work like we learned about in scopebasics.js. So when we create a closure, each closure gets its own lexical environment, meaning that they get each time we create one, like we do here in lines eight through 10, they get their own set of variables, their own name variable and anything else we were to define outside of the function. In this case, we don't have anything else. And there's more to closures. You can get in some pretty advanced scenarios. They're a powerful concept in JavaScript. The ability to retain or bind to the lexical environment of the variables that enclose the returned function, like in lines three through five, uh, to create a version of the function with some values already pre-applied is pretty powerful. Now, if you don't completely understand that, that's okay. Don't get discouraged. For now, just understand that whenever you return a function from a function, you also uh, glue any of the va variables that were defined outside of the return function, including, in this case, our input parameters. All right? That's all you need to know about closures. Well, for now, anyway. All right, so let's continue on in the next video. You're doing great. See you there. Thanks. If you think back to the lesson on object literals, I think we were working in the object.js file. I created a car object with several properties and functions. And uh, you can see that I've created a new file called this-keyword.js. If you're pausing the video to follow along, then you might want to go ahead and create a this-keyword.html. Yeah, that's right. We're going to write some JavaScript in an HTML page for the very first time in this course here in lesson number 18, because I want to show you how this works uh, in different contexts, the, this keyword. But uh, getting back to the point at hand, if you recall that example that I've pasted in from that object.js file into this keyword.js, uh, you see line number 10. And at the time, I didn't even proffer an explanation as to what the this dot make and this dot model actually mean in our, in our application. Uh, the fact is that the this keyword can be a little bit challenging. Uh, so even people with a little bit of JavaScript experience from time to time get a little confused about the this keyword. And one of the reasons people get confused about it is because it means something different in JavaScript than in most other programming languages. So you actually have to kind of fight your existing knowledge uh, so if you're coming from another programming language, the best thing you can do is kind of just leave everything you think you know about, jo about well, a lot of topics, but in particular about the this keyword at the door. Uh, and if you are just coming to JavaScript as your first programming language, then you might even have a slight advantage here because you won't have to fight yourself in what you think you know. But simply put, the this keyword in JavaScript represents the way a given function is called the way a function is called will determine what this represents, okay? So you essentially bind the this keyword to a given context, uh, and we'll explain what that means, based on how you call the function, all right? So up to now, we've not really paid much attention to how we call functions. I told you there was really only one way to call a function. Uh, using the method invocation operator. So we would do something like this a little bit later on, right? Like a card dot print description. All right. And I used the method invocation operator and I didn't even hint to the possibility that there would be another way or multiple ways to actually invoke a function. But that's actually pretty important when you consider what the this keyword represents all right you're going to learn in this video at least that there are other ways to call a method that allow you to set uh, or rather bind the this keyword to something so that you can do something interesting inside of in this case your object or your function or whatever the case might be now you may never need to do this but it's important to understand the basic rules and how the this keyword gets bound to a context and gets referenced inside of your object or your function. There's an entire book written about how this functionality works and all the permutations and, and uh, it's awesome. It's a little bit over my head at times. So I'm gonna give you an absolute beginner's explanation as to how this all works, but it should serve you well as you're getting started and then you can refine your understanding uh, a little bit later on. But 
Let's start out and by commenting out everything. And you know what? There's a really easy way to comment out everything that I haven't talked about yet. Alt, Shift, and A on your keyboard will add a uh, beginning and an ending uh, code comment character operator to whatever you have selected. So that's a nice quick way to do that. Great. All right, so let's start really simply. I'm just going to create a function called first. And this function is going to return the value of this. What is the value of this? Well, um, here, if you go console.log uh, first, is it equal to the global object inside of node? So the global object, we'll talk about that a little bit later, I guess. Um, it is kind of the, the most basic context of things that get uh, executed inside of. So when we create something in the global namespace, a global variable, we would create it essentially attached to the global namespace. It's available everywhere in our application, all right? So let's see if when we call first from line number 20 is this, which gets returned, equal to the global, the global object. So let's go um, this dash keyword, and it is true, all right? So when I call the first method, basically from the global context, because I haven't created it inside of uh, using the module pattern inside an iffy, remember what we talked about previously? So I'm, I'm basically just calling this here out in the global namespace, and what gets returned back is the fact that this is equal to that global namespace. All right. So now let's try something else. <clears throat> Actually, let me just do this. Let me copy this little comment that I have in my notes because it might be helpful to you for reference. All right. So let's start with another code example now. Function second. And the only purpose of this is just to show that there is this little flag called use strict. There's a strict mode in JavaScript. We're not going to go into it much, but this will change how um, the this keyword is bound. And so if you have use strict turned on and you try the same thing that we just did here, in fact, let me comment all this out using that alt shift a technique. And we essentially do the same thing here where we go console.log and then um, second equals global. Let's see if we get what we think we're going to get from the first time around. False. All right. Well, I happen to know that it will equal undefined. And that is a true statement. What gets returned from this when we use u strict is an undefined uh, value. It gets bound to essentially nothing. All right. So just keep that in the back of your mind. This, the rules around binding the this keyword change depending on the context. In this case, the context is you strict. It will fundamentally change how it works. All right. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the next example here. Let my object equal, and I'll create a property called value and set that to my object. And then I'm going to use the this, um, use, create a global variable called value. And I'm gonna set it on the global object by doing this global.value. At this point, I've created a new property on the global on the global object, and I'm going to call this global object. All right. Again, in Node, this has special significance. If you're doing web development, it's actually window, and we'll look at that here in just a little bit. All right. Um, so now let's go function third, 
and we'll return this dot value and then we'll do a console dot log third so by default what do you think will get printed out will we print out the value of the global object which I set to the string global object or the value of my object which is set to my object well hopefully based on what we learned in this first example you already know where I'm going with this and because we called third from the global namespace when we reference the this keyword it's referencing this global variable so when we grab the value property it's grabbing the value property of the global variable thus printing out global object let me show you that there are other ways to actually invoke the third function and we can control the binding of the this keyword like so so here we're going to console log and then I'm going to call third but I'm not going to use the method invocation operator I'm going to use the call method or the call function of the third function all right so it has a built-in method called call and there I can pass in my object and this is how I will bind the this value to my object so the value will be pulled from my object not from the global variable so let's save that here let me actually comment this one out save it and let's run it okay hopefully that makes sense there's another similar function called apply and they're very similar um, and in this context won't be obvious how they're different because I don't have any additional properties to send in um, or rather input variables to the third function so if I had something like a uh, name I would use then like call dot uh, you know Bob but this can also take an array here in the apply which could include Bob so let's just do this let's see what we get I haven't tried this beforehand so yeah object Bob okay now just out of curiosity what would happen if we did this probably nothing at all it'd just be blank yeah object undefined <laughs> all right global object with the word undefined next to it okay so hopefully that makes sense what what I just added on there that's really to illustrate the difference between call and apply and so if I had multiple input parameters in the call I would just add them on there if I had multiples I could add them on inside of an array all right that's the only difference okay but let me just kind of annotate this and talk through it just for a moment so just to kind of recap this the this keyword depends on how a function is called and an object can be passed as the first argument to call or apply and the this keyword will be bound to it like we did here in lines number 54 and 55 all right and so just to kind of remind you about this, I'm going to go ahead and say this property is set on the global object and then kind of works inside of here. This will return something different depending on how we call this method, right? And then I just want to add this little annotation here as well. Both call and apply allow you to explicitly set what you want to represent this or how we want to bind this the difference is how the additional arguments are passed in like I show you here okay so when it comes to calling a method of an object the call site will be the object itself and all of its properties are available to this in fact if we take a look back here that's what happened that's how I did this and why I use this dot make and this dot model again when it comes to calling a method of an object in this case print description the call site in this case car dot print description uh, will be the object itself and all of its properties like make model and year are available to this inner function only when I use the this keyword because this represents 
this context, all right, because I'm calling print description using the car object, all right. So to call the function, I would use the object reference. That object reference car gets bound to the this keyword. So to further illustrate this idea, let's do this. I'm going to actually select everything we've done from here down and shift alt and a. And so let's go function fifth. And uh, here I'm going to go console.log and this dot first name and a space and this dot last name. And hopefully this will make a lot more sense. All right, so now what I want to do is create two objects. So uh, let customer one equals, and we'll go first name, colon, Bob, last name, colon, Tabor, and then I'm going to create a print property that's going to point to the fifth function, like so. All right, and I'm going to copy this and just duplicate it. I'll make this customer two. Call this Richard Bouton. All right, and then finally we'll go um, customer two dot print, customer one dot print. All right, so now look at how this works. What is the context? How do I call the print method that's pointed to fifth? Well, in this first case, I'm using the object, if it'll let me get in there, object customer two, that is the context. We're gonna bind the this keyword to customer two because I'm calling it as a property of customer two. I'm gonna bind next in line number 85, the this keyword of the print method to customer one. So let's go ahead and So to me, this example is really interesting because the call site is the object's reference to the function. And the this keyword can be used to reference the various properties of the object that was used to call the function. So it becomes an interesting and elegant way to essentially pass values into a function without defining a bunch of input parameters to the function itself. All right. So now what I want to do is kind of stop working with node for a little bit and look at the this keyword in the context of a web page. So I've created a new this dash keyword dot HTML. Um, I can use the term doc. You can see that when I type in the word doc, it's an Emmet abbreviation. If you're not familiar with Emmet, just search for it online. It's basically, basically a shorthand um, syntax for, I guess you could say, for snippets for code editors, right? So when I hit enter on the keyboard, it kind of creates this, bam, this whole document outline for me. And um, it has some replaceable areas like the device width and the initial scale and the content and all that business. I don't want to change any of that stuff. What I do want to do is add a script section here near the bottom for reasons I'll talk about in another video. And then what I want to do is above that, create just a simple button. So here we go, button. And inside the button, I'm going to say, hey, uh, click me. And then I'm going to set a on click equal. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, here, I'm going to actually create a function that I want to call whenever the button is clicked. So function, and I'll give it a name click handler, like so. And inside of here, um, I'm going to go, first of all, I'm going to allow something to be passed in. I'm going to allow uh, a value to be passed in, and then I'm going to print out whatever that is to the console. So console.log arg. All right. Now, we'll come back to this in just a moment. I'm going to leave a space and go console.log this. All right. And then in here, I'm going to say the button on click equals click handler. So I'm going to call the click handler. I'm going to pass in this, the this keyword. All right. 
So if all goes well here, I should just be able to right click on this and say reveal an explorer. And then when it's in the Windows Explorer, I can just like hit the enter key on the keyboard to actually open it up in my default browser. And uh, what I want to do is I want to use the F12 tools in, uh, in Edge. I'll bring up this little window at the bottom here. And I want to look at logs. So make sure that you're on the console tab and select the log sub tab. Now click the click me button. And we'll see the results of both of our console.logs. In the first case, what we get back is the this that was passed in as arg and printed out directly to screen. And so in this case, the this keyword will reference this entire element. All right, so let's take a look at that again here. You can see how button on click gives me the whole thing. So I can do something like this, which if you're familiar with uh, web development, should not blow you away. I should be able to do arg.innerText. And if you're familiar with web development at all, you would expect to see what there. Let's refresh the page. Click the click me button again. And you see click me. All right, that's the inner text of that button. So I'm able to get to all the properties of this button. But the key here is that the this keyword represents this entire button. And I'm passing the this keyword in so that I can look at this entire button, inspect it, grab a property out. But when I use the this keyword inside of my click handler function, what do I get? I get the global object. Now we said in Node, the global object, the name of it is global. In a web browser, the global object's name is window. So I can actually just like use this little arrow, this little caret, chevron right next to object window, and it will allow me to view all of the objects, the child objects of the window. And there are literally maybe if not hundreds, definitely dozens of different objects and properties uh, that we can that we can inspect and, and change programmatically. We'll come back to some of those ideas a little bit later. But basically, the takeaway from this is that whenever code is called from an inline on event, like on click, on event handler, it's this is set to the DOM element on which that listener is defined. That's why we got back this entire button, including the text, including the closing button tag. But we've not taken any special steps to bind this inside of this function we've defined here, the click handler. So it defaults to the global object, the window object. Okay. So the moral of the story is that what the this keyword is bound to is not always obvious. It takes a bit of detective work, more so than the this keyword in other programming languages, but it has to do with how a given function is called and the site from which it is called. So in this case, this keyword is used at the call site is at this element level. In this case, the this keyword is used at the global level, all right? And that will change the value of this and what it's bound to. But by default, functions that are called uh, using the method invocation operators alone uh, will use the context in which the call is made. So if the call is made in the global context, then the this keyword will be bound to the global object. If the call is made in an object, then like we saw here near the end, the this keyword will be bound to that particular object. And we were able to use it to grab out the values of the given object, all right? And you can take control of what the this keyword is bound to by calling it using either a call or the apply method of a given function. And we talked about what they do and how they're different. And finally, whenever you use them in a uh, use the this keyword in a browser, once again, what this is bound to depends on how it's being called and who is calling it.
All right, so hopefully that clears up what the, this keyword is. I've given you a lot of examples. I've tried to speak a little bit more slowly and, and hopefully you can wrap your mind around what this actually is. And um, hopefully from this point on, you'll be able to identify uh, what this is in your code. All right, hopefully that helps. All right, you're doing great. Hang in there. We're getting close to being more than, we're more than halfway done and you're doing awesome. See you in the next video. Thanks. In this lesson, I'll briefly demonstrate how to use destructuring, which is a fairly new technique in JavaScript for unpacking values from arrays into individual variables, or I guess into other array elements of a different array. But you can also use it to unpack properties from objects, again, into other distinct variables or a different object. So uh, use this term unpack. You'll see what I mean here in just a moment. Let's start by creating a new file called destructuring.js, all right? And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is create a bunch of loose variables here, just A, B, C, D, E. We'll wind up using most of these at some point. And then I'm going to borrow that array that we created a while back. Um, maybe you recognize some of these names. Next up, uh, let's start by just destructuring this names array into um, uh, a, a set of variables. So I'm going to start off by using names, which I know is an array, and I'm going to use this bracket syntax and say, take the first element of the names array and stick it in A. Whoops, whoops, whoops. There we go. In A. Take the next element, stick it in B you know, C, D, and I could even change the order instead of um, D and E, I'll go E and then D, all right? And so let's just do um, console.log A, console.log B, and then uh, console.log D, because that's a little bit more interesting. Now we'll just go ahead and print out C as well, why not? And then um, we'll go E. All right, and so here we'll go node destructuring. All right, so take a look at what happened. We have this array. We destructured it down to a set of individual variables. And we start off with A representing David, the first element of the original array, Eddie, the second element of the original array, Alex, because we're grabbing them off in sequence. I did something a little bit interesting here and so much that I switched E and D so that E will represent Michael and D will represent Sammy. When I print them out, going back to alphabetical order, D then E, Sammy's first, then Michael. All right, so, but the key to this example is that I've taken everything inside of an array and using this style syntax, I've destructured it down to individual variables, all right? So that's just one example. There's some other interesting ways to, to work with this. Um, let's, uh, let's just go here. I'm gonna take all this, Alt-Shift-A, comment it out. And the next example, I'll do a let others. So I'm adding an additional variable here in addition to the other ones that we created originally. And here I'll go um, A, B, and then I'm gonna use this weird syntax of dot, 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 others, all right, equal names. So now um, console.log A, console.log B, and then let's see what's gets put out into others. All right, so this time, A is from David, B is Eddie, just like before. But this time, I said, 
basically everything else, just go ahead and stick them in a new array called others. All right, so that's what we see here printed out from line 21. We get this array uh, representation in our console.log, including Alex, Michael, and Sammy together. All right, so that's just another uh, twist. We can basically um, take some elements one by one. We can then also kind of combine together entire groups of elements together. Uh, let's move on to another interesting twist on destructuring. So in this third case, what I want to do is actually work with an object. And so whenever you're working with object, in objects and you're destructuring out of one object into variables or even into another object, it's really like a form of projection if you're coming from other programming languages. Grabbing out the parts that I want of the original object and putting them into a new object with a different shape, all right, without having to take all the contents of the original object. So I may only want one or two properties where the original has 10 or 20 properties. So um, here, let's uh, start off with just saying let year and model. Then I'm going to um, start off with car equals, but I'll get rid of that here pretty soon. We'll start out with let car equal, but it won't matter because we're going to remove that. And I'm just going to create a typical old object. Um, like let's say it's BMW. The model will be a 745Li. The year will be 2010. The value will be uh, $5,000, all right? And in order to destructure this, what I'm gonna do is actually remove this and say, hey, I wanna take the year and the model and put that into a new object of its own. And then what I'm gonna do is wrap this whole thing in a set of parentheses and then an end of line character like so. So now we'll do console.log year. That'll be the value here that I'm pulling out. And model. It'll be that value there that I'm pulling from the original object and printing it out. So let's see what we get. All right, so 2010 from line 34 and the 745 Li from line number 35, all right? So that's just some examples of destructuring. Um, pretty simple concept. It really is just a compact syntax that helps to clean up code whenever you're trying to map from one data structure into another or into a set of variables. And that's all that it is, all right? So hopefully that made sense. We'll see you in the next video, thanks. Another new feature of JavaScript allows you to create better literal strings through the use of templates. So the term template literal is a kind of oxymoron. Parts of the string will be literal and parts will be templatized. They'll be variable based on an expression. And so you can inject in uh, other values, variables, or you can actually run entire expressions uh, and we'll see the use of a ternary operator in just a moment. Let's start off pretty simple. We'll begin by creating a new file. We'll call this template literal literals.js. Inside of here, I'll do something really simple. Uh, let name equal Bob. All right, that's not the template literal. This will be console.log. And now I want to use the backtick characters, usually over the tilde. If you're not familiar with that region of your keyboard, it's usually right next to the number one, two, three, one, right next to the number one. You'll have to hold down the shift key to get to it. So there's one back tick. Whoops, I'm sorry, you'll you don't need the shift. The back tick key. All right. Usually above the tab key on your keyboard. And so inside of there, I'm going to use hi. And then whenever I want to uh, add something variable that will get kind of injected in from the outside, it'll be interpolated from outside of this. I'm gonna use the curly braces, and right before the curly brace, I'm gonna use the dollar sign character. So you can see that 
uh, the syntax highlighting in Visual Studio Code changes the color of this to this bright blue color. That's cool. And so then I can just say, hey, I want to use the name variable inside of there, like so. Okay. So we should be able to do something like a node template literals, like so. And I get hi, Bob. Awesome. So um, the other cool thing about template literals is that they will allow you to create multi-line strings. Now before this, you would have to do a lot of uh, using the append operator and so on. But um, in this case, you can do something like, uh, and I'm just going to copy and paste this because I don't want to type all this out. You can see here that I start my template literal with a back tick and I end it with a back tick down here at the bottom. So I'm setting this sentence or sentences, actually this paragraph, equal to this whole string and I split it up on multiple lines and there's no append character or anything like that. What I can do is console.log sentence and the neat thing too at least from what I'm concerned, is that it preserves the indentation level and the line feed character. So, you know, I could do something a little more, I guess, artistic here. Come on, let's do this just with spaces like that. Like that. And it preserves that indentation level that I have. Pretty neat, right? All right, and then the other cool thing is that uh, you can do anything inside of the expression interpolation area that you can do in a normal expression. Um, so, and let me comment all this stuff out. Control, or I'm, I'm sorry, Alt-Shift-A. And here I'm going to create a function, a real super simple function. Get reason count, just a very pithy, silly idea here. And I'm going to hard code this to return the value 1. All right. And I'll change that a little bit later so you can see the difference here. But I'm going to create a, a, a variable called interpolation. <laughs> interpolation equals, I'll use the backtick character, give me dollar sign curly braces, we'll come back to those in a minute, to try this. All right. Inside of here, make some space for myself, I can create any expression. I'm going to use the ternary operator. And so I'm going to say, hey, if get reason count, just because I wanted to make things a little bit more interesting, so I'm actually calling a function, if it is equal to 1, and here's where the ternary operator comes in, I'll say one good reason, otherwise a few reasons. All right, and this is starting to pop over out of the viewable area, but hopefully you can kind of keep track of using this uh, syntax coloring. You can see where the expression interpolation begins and ends. Inside of that, here I'm going to evaluate the call to get reason count, and if it's equal to one, I'm going to inject that part of the string in here. Otherwise, I'll inject this part of the string inside of my uh, template literal. And now, I guess the only thing left to do is just a uh, console.log interpolation. Like so. Let's go ahead and actually run this. So give me one good reason to try this. Well, maybe we should try two. Give me a few reasons to try this. All right, so you can, and I see the need for this all the time, especially in web development where you may have one item in your shopping cart or two items in your shopping cart um, to change up the, the string that gets outputted to uh, for the end user based on a quantity. All right, and probably other good uses of that as well. Uh, so string template literals are a nice addition to the JavaScript language. Here again, they can make your code more compact and readable, allowing you to do some interesting things in line that would require a lot of appending of strings uh, previously.
All right, so doing great. Let's continue on. See you in the next video. Thanks. Regular expressions allow you to create a pattern to determine if a given string matches that pattern that you created. Regular expressions, or they're often just referred to as regex or regex, are not exclusive to JavaScript. They've been around forever. They can be used in just about every programming language. Uh, and I absolutely hate talking about them because they make my head hurt. I've not committed the syntax of regular expressions to memory. And so pretty much uh, creating a pattern to find something is hard for me. And I've developed a few little crutches through the years so that I can, you know, approximate or fake my way through the usage of regex. And I suspect you'll probably find yourself doing that uh, as well, unless you're one of those really annoying people that just commit to learning regex inside and out and then, you know, can impress people at parties based on that knowledge. So, um, I, I try everything I can do to avoid memorizing it or learning the syntax. Usually if it's something simple like making sure that a string matches the pattern of a phone number, a zip code, um, some something that's fairly common, especially uh, with data in the United States, I can usually find a good example of what I'm looking for online using a search engine or Stack Overflow. But if it's something custom for the given project I'm working on, then I have to go and relearn just enough regex to get through that project. And then I try to purge it from my memory again. So I'm going to show you where to go, how to find the answers and, and cobble together your own little uh, regular expression. But uh, I'm not going to pretend like you're, you should go out and memorize any of this. I know people have done it, but but I usually wind up hating those people because they're smug know-it-alls. But I digress. Let's just take a super simple uh, regex example and, and use it in JavaScript. So I'm going to start by creating a new uh, JavaScript file called regex.js. And uh, here we're going to say, I'm going to create a simple variable called pattern. And you can create a regex pattern by beginning and ending with a forward slash. So in this case, I'm just going to say, hey, search for this pattern where there are the exactly these three characters, X, Y, and Z. All right. Super, super simple pattern. You would almost never use something this simple unless you were looking for specifically the letters X, Y, and Z inside of some long string that you want to search through or, or series of strings. All right. But there's my pattern. And so before we get started in earnest, let's just say, hey, what are you really? First of all, um, I want to print it out and then I want to console.log, see if we're working with a new data type or is this just a data type that we already know? So let's go um, node regex and uh, looks like just attempting to print it out will just be a string representation of the pattern. The type of the pattern is object. Okay, so it's a special built-in object to JavaScript. We'll talk about some of those global objects. Uh, this is just a shortcut to creating one of, an instance of that global object for uh, regex patterns. Okay, so um, here, let's continue on now and actually create some text that may or may not contain that pattern that we've defined. So let value equal, and we'll go, uh, this is XYZ, a test. All right. And so what we can do is there's a couple of, um, of methods built into both strings and regular expressions that allow us to use regular expressions against a, a string or use our pattern against um, this value in this case, this variable called value. So we'll start with the console.log and we'll use our pattern dot and IntelliSense shows us there's actually quite a few interesting things that we could use. I'm going to keep this example simple and just say use the test method. And so IntelliSense tells us that 
This will return a Boolean value that indicates whether or not the pattern exists in a search string. So what I'm going to pass in is the string I want to search through. So in this case, value. And I would expect to get back a Boolean, a true or false, if we can find XYZ in that string. So let's save it. Um, I'm going to comment out these guys. Now I'm going to save it. And now I'm going to get back here and go uh, node regex. And it is true. We do find XYZ, our pattern, inside of this string. So I'm going to comment that out. The next thing that I might want to do is actually replace that pattern that we found in that string with some other string. That's pretty useful. And I do that sort of thing a lot in software development. And this time I'm going to start with the string itself, say value.replace. And so that strings replace method has the ability for me to give it a, um, a pattern. And then I also want to give it the value I want to replace. If I find that pattern, replace it with this string. And I'll just use the, the word just. All right, like so. This is just a test. So I've removed XYZ and I replaced it with the word just by using the replace method of the string, passing in the pattern and the word. Okay. Um, there are a couple of other things. Those are the two that I find myself using most often. Here we can do something a little more interesting, I guess. Um, log value dot match. And this match function will return back an object that um, it uh, gives some information about what the string was, what the pattern was, if it was found, what the indexes in the string, like if you were to split it up uh, into individual characters, at what point in the string would we find an instance of that pattern match. So here um, we're going to pass in uh, the pattern itself. So I'll save that. And you can see it gives me back this, this array with the pattern we're searching for, the index where we can find it. So I think zero is T, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So the X, the beginning of that pattern is found at the ninth character uh, index eight, uh, eight. Oh, I guess it would be seventh character. Well, it's the ninth character index eight, right? So um, at any rate, and then the original input was the entire string itself. So we can actually um, modify this or, you know, actually grab that object out and work with it individually. So value.match and pattern. Now that I have that array that we saw down here, I can grab an individual part of it. So console.log. And here I'm going to go match.index. So it just shows you how to get an individual part of it. So here I can grab the index itself, and I could use that to do some sort of um, re custom replacement logic if I wanted to do that. I'm not sure I would want, ever want to do that. Okay, so now this comes to the part where I teach you how to cheat. And if you really want to cheat, you go out to your favorite search engine, and you type in something like zip code regex. And then if you're lucky, Bing will pop it up to the top, uh, whether it be from Stack Overflow or just gives you a nice little usage example right there in line. That's a little dangerous because you don't know if this particular example was uh, voted up or down. You might want to go and actually um, search through the comments and see the one that gets the most uh, upvotes and the selected answer and the one that doesn't cause any um, argument in the community. The other way is to go and kind of trudge through this yourself by looking at this page that, uh, and there's plenty of references out there. I prefer the developer.mozilla.org website personally. Uh, I think their documentation is awesome. And here you can learn about the various special characters and regular expressions and try to cobble together your own regular expression to find what you're looking for. But that's all you're going to get out of me. <laughs> that's all I can tell you about regex because I'm not a big fan of it. But at any rate, just to recap what we talked about in this video, uh, you can create a regular expression 
um, literal with forward slashes. Uh, you can use the regex's test method passing in a string to see if that pattern exists in that string. You can use the match method to find more details about the match. You can use the replace method of the string to replace a given match with some other string like we did when we replaced XYZ with the word just. And then, like I just showed you here at the end, I showed you how to cheat. You already know this. Look online whenever you need regex, um, whenever you need regex help, okay? So let's continue on. We'll see you in the next video, thanks. Up to now, we've looked at a number of types. Can you remember them off the top of your head? Uh, we looked at uh, string, number, boolean, object, undefined, and function as its own type. And there are a couple of others that we haven't talked about yet. We'll talk about null later. And then there's symbol, which is new uh, in the latest version of JavaScript. Probably won't talk about that in this course. But um, what I wanted to point out, though, when we were using string in particular, but this is true of the other uh, of some of the other types that we worked with, it seems to have some methods that are available to it to do some interesting things. So for example, whenever we looked at uh, regular expressions, and let me just create a new file here called natives.js. Whenever we uh, looked at the, the regular expression lesson, um, we did something like value, which is a string set to this literal string, this is XYZ a test. And we did value.replace. Well, how is it that this value has this dot replace method. We really never addressed that. Um, it, how is it something like a string can have a method? After all, we said that methods are really just functions that are defined inside of an object. So that would make a string an object, right? Or no? But a string's a string. How can that be? Well, actually, both of those are true statements. The fact is that the types we've been looking at so far, like especially string and boolean and number are known as primitive types. These primitive types then have corresponding built-ins or natives that are functions that return objects with a bunch of cool methods that are added to them by JavaScript. So behind the scenes, JavaScript does something interesting. It The JavaScript compiler will coerce your primitive, in this case, primitive string into an object that's returned from a native string function with all kinds of cool stringy type functionality included. So actually, although we haven't demonstrated this yet, you could create a string using the actual string function to do something like this. And let me comment this stuff out here. And so notice what we did here. Let string equal new. Then here's our function, that built-in function, string. Notice that has a capital S. We'll talk about that in a moment. All right. And then if we were to save this. And then um, let's go ahead and get down here and type in uh, node natives. It works, well, kind of works almost exactly like a normal string. We'll get to that in just a moment. So uh, before I address that specifically, I'm going to work with strings in this particular video uh, and with the string, capital S string function, the built-in, the native string. Uh, but what I'm about to say about strings is true whether we're talking about numbers or booleans or other, other primitives that have an equivalent uh, native associated with it. All right, so I want you to notice a couple of things and we'll work through this. Um, first of all, this starts out just like any other uh, variable that we're assigning to a string, except we use this new keyword. And I'm going to explain what the new keyword means in the very next lesson when we talk about uh, constructors. But basically, this is what creates a constructor call to this function. And then here we are calling a, a string function, capital or uppercase S in string. But isn't that bad form? Didn't you? Didn't you say, Bob, that we should create our methods with uh, camel casing and so strings should start with a lowercase s? Uh, actually, this is a special situation. It's still a convention 
indicating that this is a function that should be called using a constructor call. Again, more about that in the very next lesson, so you'll get a part two to this. But just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll come back to it. All right. So whenever we run this, as you can see here, when we ran no natives, we didn't get an actual uh, literal string output. Instead, we got basically an object that has a string property and a value set to howdy. Uh, we actually need to call a method on this native that's returned from the string function to convert it into a primitive string for the proper display inside of a console.log. So we'll need to do something like, um, here, let me just comment this out, and we'll go to string, like so. And now, there we go. We grab, uh, we convert that native, that object return from our native string function back into a primitive string and then display it on screen, okay? So, and while we're looking at things here, um, just out of curiosity, let's go console.log and then go type of my string. What would you expect to see here? Well, it is a type of object, all right? So again, what's going on here is that these built-in native types provide extra functionality like this two-string method, like this replace uh, method, and others that we'll look at in other lessons. Um, and they provide this extra functionality to their corresponding primitive types. And so just real quick, here's a list of those built-ins, those natives, all right, so it includes kind of corresponding to the primitive string, lowercase s and string, number boolean. There's also an object, a function, and a symbol. And then there are built-in natives that do not have primitive versions. Um, the primitive version as you know of array is object, and the same with regular expressions here, regex. Uh, but it does provide this native built-in with extra functionality for our arrays. So the same kind of thing happens. It's just um, not with uh, directly back to a primitive. It's to an object, but it still works with any time we're working with arrays. And then there are some other built-in natives that provide foundational um, uh, data types, I guess you can say. Uh, for important features, but are essentially just objects whose methods implement a lot of logic uh, for their features. So things like the date uh, function and the error function, we'll look at these a little bit later. But in this lesson, I want to focus solely on the relationship between primitives and built-ins. So whenever we do something like this, and let me just copy and paste some more code in here. So here we're creating a literal string, and then on this literal string, I'm going to call this method to lowercase. Behind the scenes, what's happening is that JavaScript's compiler is coercing, it's wrapping, it's boxing that primitive string, my primitive, into a built-in native equivalent in order to provide that rich set of methods that transform the string, in this case, to all lowercase letters instead of all uppercase. So. If JavaScript is coercing, wrapping, boxing our primitive into this built-in native equivalent, then what happens whenever we need to get a value back out of it? Well, the JavaScript compiler will do the opposite. It will unbox that object back into a primitive without you having to do anything special. It manages it all on its own. So um, in this case, let's just uh, kind of see what, what happens here. Just out of curiosity, let's get the type of here. We'll put the type of there, all right? And um, we'll see that when we run this. Let me make sure there's nothing else here. Let me comment all this stuff out too, at the very top of that file. All right, so now let me save that. And we can see that it treats this literal string as a string here in line 31. Then in line 32, it does that unboxing thing that we talked about to take string, make it into an object so that we can call the two lowercase method on it. And then what do we get back? Well, 
at the point when we attempt to find out what the type of my primitive is, it already has, for our purposes, essentially uh, unboxed it back into just a primitive string. All right. So it's recommended that you stick with with using the primitive and you allow JavaScript to do its magic. The compilers can do this sort of thing without breaking a sweat, so don't worry about all this boxing and unboxing and the uh, its impact on performance. But, but, let's suppose that, just for the sake of argument, that you wanted to start out with a built-in native and you want to explicitly convert that built-in native version of a string into a primitive string, how would you go about doing that? Well, here, let's take a quick example. Uh, and let's go ahead and move away from strings and just to numbers, but the same idea will apply no matter what. So I'm gonna comment all that out. Let's go let my number equals new number, notice capital N or uppercase N in number, and then in the constructor argument we'll pass in the actual value that we want to set that number to. All right. So at this point, let's do a console.log and then let's find out what the type of number my number is. Have any guesses on what it will be? Let's go ahead and stop right there and let's make sure we understand it's of type object at this point. Now I want to take it out of that built-in native and I want to grab just the value of my number out and put it into a primitive. So here we go, let my primitive, I'll just reuse that variable name here, equals my number dot and then to grab the value out regardless of whether we're working with string, number, boolean, whatever the case might be, we'll use this method on this object called value of. So the value of method and now we should do a console.log my primitive. Actually, we know what the value will be. What's more interesting is the type of. So now let's run that. And so here in line number 36, we're going to get it's an object, but we use value of to retrieve the actual value of our built in native object into a regular number. And we print that out in line number 38. Okay. So to recap, the point of this lesson is to explain what these functions are uh, that have the same name as our primitive types, but with an uppercase letter. Uh, they are built-in native functions that are intended to be constructor called. We'll learn about that in the next lesson. And the JavaScript compiler uses these functions to return an object that supports lots of rich features to each primitive data type, and we'll see those in upcoming lessons. But the JavaScript compiler will box and unbox your primitive types into these built-in native equivalents as needed, and will do so without any help from you, and will do it all behind the scenes. And you can explicitly create instances of these objects and then use the value of method like we saw here just a moment ago to convert them into their primitive equivalents, but it's not really necessary. So, you know, what's this new keyword all about? And what's this uppercase letter in this function name all about? Well, I'm gonna explain that in the very next lesson. We'll see you there, thanks. So previously we saw how to create an object literal using uh, this style of syntax. Uh, and you'll note that I've already created a file called constructors.js. Go ahead and take a moment to create that yourself if you want to follow along. I'm just going to paste in the car that, uh, the literal car that we created in a previous lesson here with the make model and the year property uh, set to BMW 745 LI and 2010 respectively. Now, there's actually another technique for creating an object, and that's through the use of what are called constructor functions. So let me go ahead now, comment this out, and then let me go and create a new function, and I'm gonna name it car, and it'll have some input parameters uh, one for each of the properties that I want to initialize upon the creation of the object that gets returned from this function. So make uh, model and year. And then we're simply going to say, hey, uh, the object that gets returned set its make property to the make 
uh, input prep uh, parameter that was passed in as the first input parameter. And you're going to add a model property to that object, and you're going to set it equal to the model parameter that was passed in. And then you probably guess what this next line of code will do. Same thing with year, right? And most importantly, whenever you're creating an object using this, this function, it requires the new keyword. So let my car equals new car with a capital C. Did you notice that I named my function with a capital C car? I'll explain that in just a moment. And IntelliSense tells me that it requires three input parameters into this function. So here we'll go uh, BMW 745LI 2010. All right. And so what's really going on here? And let's just go ahead, console.log, just to prove there's nothing up my sleeve here. My car. And here we're going to go uh, node constructors. And there you go. We get a car uh, object that has the properties make, model, and year populated. All right. So what's going on here is that the new keyword creates an empty object. Calling the function, in this case car, it will take that empty object as the this. Remember our discussion about how the this keyword gets bound to the context from which it's called? Well, in that case, that new object gets kind of becomes the context for this function call. And so this empty object starts receiving new properties on lines 8, 9, and 10 with new values set to those new properties. What gets returned from this whole thing with the call to this function is an object with properties make, model, and year already set. All right? So it's important to remember that the functions themselves that we define here beginning in line 7 are not constructors, although if you're coming from another programming language like Java or C Sharp, you might be inclined to think in those terms because that's how they work. But rather, in JavaScript, it's the new keyword in front of any normal function, any function, that makes it a constructor call. All right, It creates a, uh, a new empty object, and it will pass it as the this to that uh, function call that you make. So the new keyword kind of elbows its way into the execution. Pardon me, excuse me, I need to get in here. And it, uh, and it says to the function, first before you execute, I need to create an empty object and give that to you in the this. So it's bound, so this is bound to this new empty object. And then it says, okay, now you can continue to do whatever you were going to do. Now the function itself could ignore that new empty object, or it could use it like we have in 8, 9, and 10 here, all right? So just to kind of prove that, let me go ahead and comment all that out. And let's create a function, my function. And I'll just do something simple like, hey, uh, I am a simple function, right? And then we're gonna go var my function equals new my function. And then we're going to go console.log type of my function. Or actually, let's go lowercase m for my function. I've got some things wrong here. Like, there we go. That's what I want to do. And um, so let's all kinds of problems with that line of code, but I caught them before I executed it, so that's good. All right, so you can see here in line number 21, we are creating a new empty object and then calling my function. My function executes, uh, but not before a new empty object is kind of passed to it in the this. Now, this is not used in the body of my function, so it's returned back to this variable of the same name but with a lowercase m probably should have chose a different name if that causes any confusion i apologize just remember lowercase m my function is different than uppercase m my function in this particular case 
But when we take a look at the type of my function, it is object, all right? And so at this point, you know, it's an object, so you can't really do anything interesting with it. It's no longer uh, a function, so you can't do that. In fact, here, let me just um, kind of copy and paste this little note I put to myself in my notes here. You can't really do anything with this particular object. It's certainly not a function reference anymore. Uh, it used the function as a constructor, but the constructor function didn't really do anything to populate the properties of it. And, you know, this will not actually do anything. In fact, if anything, let's just see what happens if we run this. Yeah, we get an ex exception here that my function is not a function. So we really can't even, we can't do that. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. The right reasons why. But the only thing you can do with, you know, what gets returned here, my function is that you can attach properties and methods to that empty object, which is kind of the point of the new keyword entirely. All right. So what about this upper case? first letter convention. I said that it was a convention. What's a convention? What is this particular convention, uh, you know, specifically? Well, you're basically saying my intent is that this function be called using the new keyword. That's what the convention is. Basically, I am a function, but I should be called, uh, I should be used as a constructor. So you should only use a new keyword on me and I'm expecting an empty object be passed to me so I can set some properties on it or maybe add some methods as the case might be. All right. So just keep in mind that in JavaScript, what makes a constructor function has nothing to do with the function declaration itself, but rather how the function is being called. It must be called using the new keyword in order to be a constructor function. So in the previous lesson, we learned about the built-in native constructor functions that return objects with properties and methods to wrap around the primitive types and give them essentially superpowers, giving them new properties and methods that will operate on the primitive value. New, functional, new functionality like the two uppercase, uh, the two lowercase, the length property, and others that we'll learn about. But that's why they're defined as uppercase S in string, uppercase N in number, uppercase B in Boolean, and so on. That's why you can explicitly create one of those built-in natives if you use the new keyword like we demonstrated in that previous video. So hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, if nothing else, I hope you're learning how JavaScript is all about functions, first of all, and secondly, how you call a function really changes the, the, the meaning of the function and what it's intended to be used for. It changes even in some cases the functionality that's defined inside of the function, like in the case of this, or perhaps changes the purpose of the function like we saw here um, with the new keyword and uh, calling into the function. All right, so doing great. Let's continue on. See you in the next video. Thanks. JavaScript has objects, and we've seen how to create a literal object, and we've seen how we can construct an object using a constructor function and the new keyword, like in the previous video. In some of the most popular programming languages, you create an object using a pattern called a class or a construct called a class. In other words, you create a class named car, and then you create individual instances of the car class as individual separate objects. Now, furthermore, you can create specialized versions of one class, borrowing all the properties of that parent class in the new child class. So you have an original class and you say, I want to inherit everything that that original class does in my new class. And then you can extend it by adding properties and methods to it to make it a more specialized version of that original or parent class. So uh, to kind of extend the analogy here, I may have a car class, but I want to create a sports car class that extends the definition of just a normal car and it adds on things that make it sporty. Same thing with a minivan. It's just like a car. It has some of the basic principles of a car, but a minivan also has like number of passengers and cargo capacity, things that make it unique, a unique type of car, all right? And then I can create instances or objects based on that 
minivan or objects based on the sports car and those objects um, are both have similarities to a regular car but they have differences as well all right so that's kind of the notion of of uh, classes and inheritance and classes and inheritance are a foundational concept uh, associated with object oriented programming not sure if you've ever heard the term but it's a pretty big deal among software developers so you might be asking yourself well, first of all does JavaScript have classes well yes and no I mean in JavaScript you have objects and you can create an object and dynamically add properties and methods to it whenever you want to. But objects are the focus in JavaScript. In languages like C Sharp and Java and C++, you create a class and you add properties and methods to the class up front. And they're static in so much that they cannot be changed. So you can't be adding um, properties and method declarations to the object at runtime. I mean, you can, but it's not the original intent of object-oriented programming. Um, they can't be changed over the lifetime of any objects that are instances of that class. So here in, in object-oriented programming, uh, languages, base languages like C Sharp and Java, classes are the focus. JavaScript, objects are the focus. C Sharp, Java, C++, classes are the focus. The latest version of JavaScript does in fact have the concept of a class, but it's a weird little stopgap measure to help people that are trying to make the mental leap from an old language that they might be familiar with, like C Sharp or Java, into uh, the world of JavaScript to a dynamic object-based programming model. So I talk about JavaScript classes in one of the upcoming lessons, and we'll get to that soon enough. But I guess, okay, so JavaScript kind of supports classes, kind of doesn't support classes. What about inheritance? Well, here again, JavaScript, yes, it kind of supports inheritance, but not really uh, the kind of inheritance from traditional object-oriented programming. So in JavaScript, you have something different called a prototype chain. So let's suppose that you've defined a literal object like our typical car example that we've seen so many times. Won't even paste it to screen. You know what it looks like. It has a make, model, and year property, right? And so you define this literal object like our typical car example. You like the properties and the methods that you've already added to that, to that object and you would like to use that car object as the basis for a new car object. Um, you'll probably wind up changing some parts of the object's definition, maybe some new values and a few of the properties. You might even add some new properties and methods to that new object. And I'm going to demonstrate a technique that allows you to construct a new object based on an existing object here in just a moment. But when you do that, when you create a new object based on an old object, something uh, special happens in JavaScript. There is a permanent link that's created between those. It, the new object always knows who it inherited all those properties, its original set of properties from. How did it get created? It always knows uh, kind of the link between it and the prototype that came before it. All right. In other words, the original object serves as a prototype for the new object, and the new object is essentially chained to that prototype from that point on. So in languages like C Sharp and Java and C++, those traditional object-oriented programming languages, you create a class hierarchy where one class inherits from another class. So whenever you create an instance of the child class, there's really nothing that's linking that, that instance of the child class back to the parent class. So there's nothing linking that child object back to the parent class definition. So here again, the focus is not on the relationship of individual objects uh, that happen to be linked to each other and kind of have a brotherhood, uh, but rather more of a parent-child relationship in traditional object-oriented programming. Again, the relationship between classes is the focus of object-oriented programming, whereas in JavaScript, it's the relationship between uh, between objects and how they're chained together.
It's a sub, uh, subtle but important distinction between JavaScript and other and uh, traditional object-oriented programming languages. So some people use the term JavaScript prototypal inheritance. All right, but I've tried to stay away from the term inheritance when talking about JavaScript because it might conjure up traditional object-oriented programming concepts that would mislead you whenever you're considering how it all works in JavaScript. One of my favorite, favorite JavaScript authors, uh, Kyle Simpson, called this style of object-based prototypal inheritance. It calls it really objects linking to other objects, or ULU, <laughs> O-L-O-O, -O. objects linking to other objects. And I really like that description. And by the way, I'm not sure one way is necessarily better than the other. They're different. Uh, there are pros and cons depending on what you're trying to accomplish, the given problem you're trying to, uh, to solve. So what I do want to do is have a better thorough understanding of how you know, objects linking to other objects actually works and what are some of the ramifications of that. So that's what we'll do in the rest of this video. <clears throat> so you can see that I have a new file called prototypes.js and here I'm going to paste in my original car. This looks an awful lot like the car literal that we've been creating, object literal that we've been creating up to this point. Now I told you that there's a way to create a new object based on an existing object. And so let me do that. We're going to say, hey, let our new car equal capital O object dot create and then original car. All right, so at this point, if we do, for example, console.log new car dot make, for example. So let's um, <clears throat> go node prototypes. Okay, so we have this new car and what it looks like at least at first glance, it appears as though we have a new object called new car and the value of the original car has been copied in uh, of the make property of the original car has been copied into the make property of the new car. But that's not exactly what's going on here as we'll, we'll talk about here in just a moment. But at this point, I have two objects. I have the original car and I have the new car. And I could do several things at this point with new car. I could change the values of the existing properties that I have on new car. I could add new properties to new car or new methods to the new car. Or I could delete the existing properties from new car. All right. But more interestingly, I want to revisit something I said earlier about the relationship between the original car and the new car, that there's a link between the new object and its prototype, its predecessor, the original car. And so if we do something like console.log and we say uh, object.get prototype of, and inside of that method, I'm going to say new car. So tell me who the prototype of this object new car is. And it'll say it's this object right here, where the make is BMW, the model 745 Li in the years 2010. All right. So it's pointing to this original car. So let's do this instead. We can actually get a reference to my prototype. <clears throat> get prototype of passing in new car. And then I can do console.log my prototype dot make. And so you can see here that I'm able to get back to that, um, to the make property of the original car. Now there's no way to really prove that because they both seem to have the same values right now, but we're gonna push this a little bit further. Um, what happens if I were to add a property to the prototype? In other words, what happens if on original car, I were to add a doors property, like a doors count. So if you remember, all I need to do on an object to add a property is just go, hey, I just want a new property called doors. So I do dot doors. And then I'm going to create the value and say, hey, it's four. Now, 
Let's go console.log new car dot doors. All right. And you can see that the new car gets this doors property and it seems to be copying that new property over, but that's really not true. But we definitely see that there's a link between the uh, the new object and its prototype, the original car. But how do I know if the property is defined on the new object or on the prototype? Well, here's what we can do. And so this is gonna help us to kind of get to the bottom of this relationship right here. We're gonna start with the original car and says, do you have your own property? Does this property belong to you? Or are you essentially borrowing it from your predecessor? So first of all, <clears throat> it's true that the original car has its own property called doors. Okay, so console.log new car, do you have your own property called doors? And that's false. All right. So kind of tying this all together and kind of explain what's really going on here. Well, whenever we attempt to get a property or call a method on an object, JavaScript will go through a series of lookups to find the value or the definition of the property or the method in order to call it. So after we created new car, it had none of its own properties. If we asked it for the value of one of its properties, doing something like uh, we did um, here in line number nine, it would find the prototype that new car links to and see that if it has its uh, make property. So we know that the new car does not have a property that we define on it called make, but what about its prototype? And yes, the prototype, the original car has a make property and it's set to BMW, okay. But once we do something like this, new car dot make equals Audi. All right. So we are changing the property or actually we're creating a property on new car and we're setting its value to Audi. At that point, what happens is whenever we come down here and basically call the same, essentially same line of code now in line 11, it's saying, hey, New car, do you have a property called make? And new car says, yes, I do now. I have my own property called make, and it's set to the value Audi, all right? So no longer do you have to continue and look at my prototype to find the property and its value. You can look at me and find the property and its value, all right? So JavaScript doesn't need to look at the prototype chain if the property is created and set on uh, the new object that is essentially um, uh, created from the prototype. So if we ask for a property that's not yet been defined, so here we go, let's go here in line number 12, console.log new car dot whatever. All right, now think about this. Whatever property does not exist on new car. Whatever property does not exist on its prototype, the original car. So what happens next? Um, well, then JavaScript will traverse back and say, hey, original car, what are you linked to? And since we defined original car like this, we're linked back to type object. Actually, it is the, um, the built-in native object function. However, the whatever property is not defined on that either. So now what happens? Well, finally, JavaScript will do one final traversal asking the object built in native object what its prototype is. And by default, it will return the primitive undefined. So when we get to line number 12, in fact, let's go ahead and comment out just about everything else here. I'm gonna hit A there and we'll get rid of all this just so we can kind of see what we're doing here. So at this point, what happens? We get undefined. Why? Because new car doesn't have a whatever property. We look back and 
The prototype, original car, doesn't have a whatever property. Its prototype, object, doesn't have a whatever property. And its prototype is undefined, and that gets returned. Okay, that's the end of the chain, so to speak. And that, my friends, is basically how the prototype chain works in JavaScript. You don't have to use this. You probably should know it, although you could probably go your whole career and not really have to ever deal with it. However, this is fundamentally how all your objects work and why you get the undefined type returned when you attempt to access a property value that doesn't exist. So I tried to make this as simple as possible, but this is a post-beginner topic. In fact, I was looking at some tutorials online and I saw that this was actually an advanced topic. But if you kind of understand what we're talking about here, let's think about how far you've come in your JavaScript understanding to get to this point where you can kind of understand what's going on. That's impressive. So I would just recommend that you watch this again. You take a look at a few other tutorials online and you give it some time to sink in and you'll probably leapfrog over a bunch of people who are uh, trying to learn JavaScript, but not really pushing themselves past the absolute basics. You're doing great. Hang in there. Uh, we're, we're making great progress, and we're getting close to the end, uh, relatively close. All right, so we'll see you in the next video. Thanks. In the previous lesson, I said that JavaScript doesn't have classes at least not in the traditional object-oriented programming sense. Nor did it have inheritance in the traditional object-oriented programming sense. I explained how JavaScript is focused on objects and the linkage between objects that are based on objects. We also looked at constructor functions that allow you to construct a new object from a function call, but this really isn't a class in the traditional object-oriented sense either. But technically, JavaScript does actually now have classes or the notion of a class. And it was introduced in the last version of JavaScript. Now, JavaScript classes give you the impression that you're working with something that resembles traditional object-oriented programming. Uh, but in reality, nothing has really changed. JavaScript remains object-focused, and objects can still be prototypally prototyped prototype chain together. I don't know how to say it correctly. Uh, JavaScript classes are what is termed syntactic sugar on top of the existing JavaScript object and prototype models. Uh, that term, syntactic sugar, you'll see that frequently in software development circles. It's programmer slang. That means that they added a few keywords and structures in JavaScript, but these merely map to existing features of JavaScript. They don't really add new features per se. So the syntactic sugar might help those who are transitioning from more traditional programming languages to JavaScript, but JavaScript purists are quick to point out that this new feature, the class feature in JavaScript, may do more harm than good because at the end of the day, you still have to make the switch from classic or traditional object-oriented programming to a more object-based prototype inheritance, if you want to use that term. Uh, and if you're working with prototypes, you have to learn the things that we talked about in the previous lesson. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, let's talk about what a class is uh, and, and define a class. It's essentially a way to define and create objects. And so just like there are function declarations and function expressions. Now there are class declarations and class expressions. So let's start off with just uh, looking at a class declaration. And so you do something like class car, whereas an expression would be more like let car equal class and then whatever, okay? So fairly simple and hopefully straightforward. It's basically a declaration, you give it a name, an expression is, well, it's an expression. So JavaScript classes can have a constructor function that gets called automatically whenever you use the new keyword. So let's go with the declaration version of this. Um, I'll comment this out, this expression. All right, so inside of the declaration, 
let's create a constructor function, you have to use the term constructor. Then you can add any input parameters that are essentially going to map to properties that you're going to add to a new instance of an object based on this class. So here again, you do something like make model and year. And just like in the constructor functions that we learned about a couple of videos ago, 